morning ladies and gentlemen requesting you all to kindly take your seats as we are thrilled to begin the proceedings for the day very very shortly requesting you all please take your seats thank you We will be beginning the proceedings uh, very, very shortly, just about a minute or so. Please take your seats as we'd like to start on time. Hello, hello, check, check, hello, hello, check, hey, hey. Hello, check, hey. Hello, check, check, hello, hello, check, 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 hello, hello, check. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar. I was hoping for a brighter start to the day. So good morning. Let's... Wonderful. My name is Radhika Bajaj. And on behalf of the Institute of Directors, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the 17th International Conference on Corporate Social Responsibility. I'm absolutely delighted to be your host today. And uh, it is a very special day, isn't it? Because we're meeting in person together after a gap uh, of about three years. So definitely this is a special day and we are thrilled to host you. We want to welcome our very esteemed and distinguished IOD members, IOD fellows, associates, our distinguished guests and the IOD India Global Family. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this two-day conference will discuss and deliberate upon various important aspects of CSR connected to the boardroom. We will also hear about innovative practical insights from some of our well-performing organizations. This year's theme, ladies and gentlemen, as many of you would know, is board strategy in making CSR inclusive. The famed annual Golden Peacock Awards for Corporate Social Responsibility, both global and national categories, HR Excellence and uh, Innovation Management for the year 2022 will also be presented during this conference, and we are very much looking forward to that later this evening. IOD, ladies and gentlemen, has a strong legacy of bringing together eminent and illustrious leaders, distinguished and esteemed speakers, renowned experts and policy makers across governments, businesses and civil society to enlighten and illuminate us regarding the most crucial challenges faced by businesses across all verticals. For many years, through its conferences and publications, the Institute of Directors India has championed corporate governance and sustainability in not just India, but also globally. We'd like to take a moment here and extend a big thank you to all our partners as well as supporters for their overwhelming guidance and support for this very special program. We would like to extend our thanks to our hospitality partner, the Indian Hotels Company Limited, our platinum partner, State Bank of India, Sriram Finance Limited, our gold partner, the City and Industrial Development Corporation, Sitco, our silver partners, KPMG India, PWC India, and the Bajaj Foundation. Also, our thanks to our bronze partners, CBM India Trust, Union Bank of India, Maharashtra State Power Generation Company Limited, Mahajenko, National Payments Corporation of India, SBI Life Insurance Company Limited, Maharashtra State Warehousing Corporation. Also, our thanks goes out to our associate partners, which is Care Ratings Limited, Indian Oil Corporation Limited, Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, National Handloom Development Corporation Limited, Leather Industries Development Corporation of Maharashtra, and Rosefield DAA International. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your support for our partners by a big round of applause, please. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, like every auspicious occasion, let us start this IOD Global Convention with the customary lamp lighting ceremony. May I please request Lieutenant General Surinder Nath, PVSM, AVSM retired, President, Institute of Directors, and Mr. Ashok Kapoor, IAS retired, Director General, Institute of Directors, India, to come forward and kindly welcome our distinguished guests for the lighting of the lamp. Please, General Nath and Mr. Kapoor, can I request you to join us for the lighting of lamp ceremony? I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to the speakers of the opening session for the ceremony, Mr. Shishir Bajaj, Bajaj Group Patriarch and Chairman, Bajaj Foundation, Mr. Sundara Raman Ramamurthy, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, BSC Limited, Mr. Vijay Karya, Chairman and Managing Director, Ravin Group of Companies, and Mr. Shailesh V. Haribhakti, FCA, Board Chairman and Independent Director on multiple boards in India. With the lighting of the lamp, we invoke the blessings of the higher powers to show us the path to success and to making a tangible positive difference to the world around us. It's a beautiful and auspicious moment as we kickstart the day's proceedings. So please show your enthusiasm. A big round of applause.
I request all our guests to please uh, join us on the stage now as we begin our opening session. So once again, I'd like to request Mr. Shishir Bajaj uh, to join us on the stage. Mr. Sundara Raman Ramamurthy also kindly join us on stage, sir. Mr. Vijay Karya, as well as Mr. Shailesh V. Haribhakti. And of course, we'd like to request General Nath and Mr. Kapoor to join us on the stage as well. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to request Mr. Ashok Kapoor, IAS retired, Director General Institute of Directors India to deliver the welcome address. Just a little note on the rich experience that Mr. Kapoor brings with him. Mr. Kapoor was an officer of the Indian Administrative Service 1967 batch, he served the government of India in various capacities, including as secretary and magistrate of various districts. During 1992 to 1994, he was appointed leader of the Indian delegation to the UN Conference on Biological Warfare. In September 1991, he was appointed as Joint Secretary, Ministry of Civil Supplies and Food and Science and Technology, Government of India. A warm welcome to you, Mr. Kapoor. We look forward to your address, sir. Thank you, friends. Uh, first of all, on behalf of IOD India, we convey our thanks and gratitude to all of you for partic participating in our 17th International Conference on Corporate Social Responsibility. The sub-theme emphasizes the overall board strategy for tomorrow's boards in making CSR inclusive. Our annual London Global Convention last month was an encouraging success for us. Experts, directors, and subject specialists from more than 19 countries that participated besides India had reached a consensus that CSR, even for those companies that have limited profits, which are even less than the statutory, statutory minimum of five crores or more, could experiment in their own limited way to earn additional market goodwill and acceptability. Our friends, a little departure from my uh, notes, written notes. It's a delightful coincidence for India and for IOD that today one of our main guests, which was announced, is happens to be Mr. Shishir Bajaj. Uh, Mr. Bajaj, you may be knowing, is a very uh, distinguished corporate leader and now into foundation, Bajaj Foundation. But he happens to be the grandson of the, I should say, the father of modern corporate governance and CSR. That is Mr. Jamna Lal Bajaj. The, the CSR owes its uh, origin to the philosophy of Gandhi, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, and a biographer described Mr. Bajaj's grandfather as a corporate Gandhi. So we are a delight. will confirm the famed Golden Peacock Awards to the winners later today and tomorrow. They'll be with us. We also welcome our guests of honor, Dr. Ajay Bhushan Pandey, IS, Chairman, National Financial Reporting Authority and former Finance Secretary, Government of India, who will be delivering the keynote address. Also, Secretary, Medical Education and Drugs Department and Secretary, Textile State Government. Dr. Pandey has conveyed that he is uh, unable to reach Bombay because of slight indisposition, but he'll be with us virtually and he'll deliver his address. We today welcome our foreign experts, that is Director, University of Switzerland and Senior Director of the Sustainable Development UK, who are with us on both the days. Friends, CSR today has become a prime focus of well-performing companies 
which is in their own long-term interest. We in India are proud of the fact that India was the first country in the world to legislate on this crucial issue. Drawing inspiration, no doubt, from the fact that uh, Mahatma Gandhi said that the beginning CSR is much more than charity, but it was a Gandhian thought translated into law that for in the ultimate analysis, philanthropy and charity is not a virtue, it's a duty. So that has been incorporated by India in its Companies Act of 2013. This CSR statutory provision is now being followed by even other developed countries such as UK, Norway, Sweden, etc. It is recorded by the IOD in our uh, records that based on studies that show that CSR is now the focus of a company which is on which is based on case studies of CSR in implementation and best practices. So much has been the success of this legislation that even it has been recorded by the National Stock Exchange. And uh, we have the pleasure of the president of the Bombay Stock Exchange that uh, even some loss-making companies may not have 5% net profit. Uh, uh, five, uh, five crores net profit are practicing CSR. I guess it is in their own interest for market goodwill. CSR le leads to improved reputation and brand management. It attracts and helps recruit, develop, and retain talent. It leads to improved innovation, con competitiveness, and market positioning. CSR leads to enhanced operational efficiencies and cost savings. It leads to improved ability to attract and build effective and efficient supply chain relationships. It leads to enhanced ability to address change. It leads to more robust social licenses, so to say, to operate in the community. It leads to better access to capital. It leads to improved relations with regulators. It acts as a catalyst for this responsible consumption. It leads to a better anticipation and management of an ever expanding spectrum of risk. Friends, it's been recorded by the National Stock Exchange that companies, almost 50% of the companies are spending more on CSR. They are under no legal obligation to do so because they find it, it brings them so much of market leadership and goodwill. We are today thankful to all of you who have spared your precious time and also to thereby educate us all about this important surveyed by them almost 95% are complying with CSR regulations. That is the rate. And as I said, more than 60% are those that are spending more than the statutory minimum. I today welcome the business leaders of Tata Motors, Ravin Group of Companies, BSC Limited, Sitco, Maharashtra, Indian Oil, Price Waterhouse Coopers, KPMG, Mahindra Resort, Rosary Biotech, PDS Limited, Indian Hotels Company, the National Handlooms Development Corporation, CBM India, Rosefield DA International, Mahajenko, Care Ratings, Equitas Holdings, Greenco Group, Shiram Finance, State Textiles Department, Lidcom, NSC, Sonia, BLW Precision, SP Jan Institute of Management, etc., which only goes to show that the CSR finds very wide acceptance in almost all the well performing companies in India today. Today, we also welcome, we welcome all the 18 winners of Corporate Social Responsibility GP Awards which will be later on conferred tonight 
by the Honorable Minister, five winners of innovation management, and 11 winners of HR excellence with their detailed presentation over two days. All the winners are here with us from all over India to, re to receive the awards in person. Friends, at a philosophical level, CSR is nothing but growth of democracy at grassroots. Increasingly, the companies are not only deputing staff for CSR activities, but they find, and I, they have informed IOD, that any of these staff are volunteering to do CSR work, which is basically makes them very good corporate citizenship. We use the term corporate citizenship, which is not very well defined in management, but in the definition of corporate citizen by IOD, we have said that if staff of private companies are volunteering to do CSR work, it is a grand manifestation and endorsement of the traditional wisdom. I, uh, I would like to quote today the great Chinese philosopher, sage, and thinker Confucius, who said, and I quote Confucius, what I hear, maybe I remember, but what I see, yes, I'm likely to remember. But what I do with my own hands, I'll remember all my life, unquote. So this is the rationale of CSR. Friends, a, wa a very hearty welcome to all of you. And thank you for the distinguished speakers, guests, and eminent personalities on the days. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Kapoor, for so clearly and beautifully outlining the importance of a CSR for organizations, employees, as well as for the society at large. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for the President's Address, and for that, I'd like you to extend a warm welcome to Lieutenant General Surinder Nath, PVSM, AVSM, retired. He, of course, is the President of the Institute of Directors. He is former Chairman of the UPSC, Vice Chief of Indian Army and also Independent Director on the Board of Larsen and Tubro Limited, commissioned into Regiment of Artillery in June 1957. General Nath took active part in the 1971 Indo-Pak War in the Jammu Samba sector. As Vice Chief of the Army Staff, he was deeply involved in strategic, uh, strategic planning, pardon me, procurement of equipment and armament and transfer of technology. After rendering 38 years of army service, he also served as chairman of UPSC from 1998 to 2002. Welcome, sir, and we look forward to your address. Over to you, General Nath. Our distinguished guests on the stage, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to everyone. It's nice to be here in Bombay, particularly after the cold wave from operating in Delhi for quite some time now. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Bombay. I've been a frequent visitor here. So I'm very happy that we've had the opportunity to have this seminar here this time. And more so, the seminar in a physical mode because earlier on, we have been having it mostly in virtual mode because of the pandemic conditions. But now that the pandemic conditions have improved, so we felt that it will be much better that we have an interactive session uh, and have this meet as a physical meet. And to that extent, I'm very happy that we have good attendance here and uh, corporate social responsibility, as you all are aware, I think now, over the years, we have been watching in the Institute of Directors. Uh, I have been with the Institute for the last now more than 11 years. And we found that the, the overall performance of the companies 
have improved considerably. People are now very, very conscious. They know exactly what is to be done as far as the corporate social responsibility is concerned. And every year we see a lot of improvement taking place. To that extent, our Golden Peacock Awards have also brought in a very healthy competition amongst the competitors. And that has helped in the corporate sector to improve their various initiatives and various projects as far as the corporate social responsibility is concerned. I would now welcome you all. I have great pleasure in doing that on behalf of the Institute of Directors for the 17th International Conference on Corporate Social Responsibility being held here today and tomorrow. This year, we are organizing the International Conference, as I mentioned, in Mumbai, which is the financial hub of our country. And not only that, it is the state of Maharashtra, which really spends lots of money and they're very, very particular on looking after their responsibilities as far as corporate social responsibility is concerned. More about it when we go into this, I'll discuss that. The theme of this morning's conference is board strategy in making CSR inclusive. In the evening time, we'll also host the Golden Peacocks uh, Awards presentation ceremony for the international winners, for the institutional winners of the 2022 awards for CSA, both local and global awards for HR excellence and for innovation management. The award winners after that tomorrow, they will be giving a presentation to all their colleagues and their people who have taken part in this competition. And they will present their case studies to each one so that they can share their knowledge for the benefit of all the people who are here, present here. They can also uh, give their reasons as to why they have been able to win this award and what are the specific new initiatives or new projects that they have undertaken to make this corporate social responsibility much more effective. Now, CSR being considered in the present context is an important installation to overcome the difficulties of the deprived and the needy persons. Can you hear me at the back clearly? Yes? Okay. Through CSR, various companies, they have been discharging their responsibility towards the society that exists in their environment. The corporate citizenship has evolved, encompassing the provisions of Companies Act 2013 and the actions that helped serve the society in an inclusive and responsible manner. Uh, um, the provisions of the Schedule 7 of the Companies Act that has been taken care of and the actions that helped serve the society in an inclusive and responsible manner, provisions of Schedule 7 of the Companies Act 2013. They have facilitated larger contribution of the corporate sector into the government programs. Boards have been now fully involved in the areas of greater social significance and their role has been prominent in including CSR inclusive on their strategic planning. To include, mostly to give greater importance to rural development, to education, to health, safe drinking water, sanitation, and women empowerment by enhancing vocational skills. This integrated approach of corporate world with government programs and, and schemes have created an ecosystem after large number of persons are able to get out of the hunger, malnutrition, 
and poverty trap and lead more decent lives. Boards have evolved strategy for economic growth, which focuses on diversity, equality, and inclusiveness. There has been sufficient impact of CSR activities on uplifting the poor and poverty and malnutrition, good corporate governance, which ensures that effective CSR program supports inclusiveness. The second provision in the section 135 of the act that provides that the company shall give preference to the local areas and areas around it where they operate. However, in order to ensure all India spread of CSR expenditure, the ministry wide their general circular number 14 oblique 2021 dated 25th August 2021 has clarified that the emphasis on local area is only directory and not mandatory. Companies need to balance local area preference with national priorities. Now, a large amount is also spent in the national level. For example, in financial year 2021, out of expenditure of 25,000 crores spent on CSR, rupees 7,490 crores that was spent not in the states, but at the pan-India level. IOD earlier also had suggested this and recommended to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs that it's the, uh, the uh, CSR expenditure should not be confined only to their local areas, but it should be pan-India and that has now been accepted and they have issued the clarification. India's companies have spent major share of their CSR funds and education on education, on health and rural development during the five years, that is financial five years, 2016-17 to financial year 2020 and 21. I'll show you a slide which shows that between 2016-17 and 2021, corporates have spent 29,918 crores on education. They have spent 20,716 crore on healthcare and rupees 9,820 crore on rural development. In a reply to the Rajya Sabha, the Corporate Affairs Ministry stated that around 33% of the total CSR spent by the companies was in the states of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Tam and Tamil Nadu. Similarly, around 60% of the total CSR spent by the companies is in the areas of education, healthcare, and rural development related activities. Uh, total ex expenditure on CSR on annual basis crosses more than one uh, more than one lakh crores. So that is the kind of funds which are now being spent on CSR every year, more than one lakh crores of rupees. Maharashtra being the biggest contributor to the GDP, they spent the highest amount, that is rupees 15,000 crores on CSR in the five-year period. Karnataka spent 5,922 crores and Gujarat spent 5,294 crores. In fact, we have seen in the various applications which came from the companies that there are quite a few companies which are voluntarily spending more than 2% of their net profit, which is laid down in the act, but they are spending even much more than 2% of the net profit, which is something very good for all of us. CSR emphasizes and advocates the role of business in society, 
beyond the traditional role of maximizing profits. Corporates are presently considered also the engines of social transformation. In other words, CR, CSR has moved from fringes to the, to the mainstream of and corporate, uh, corporate consciousness, turning business into a cause. The biggest challenge today lies on managing diversity and bridging disparities, investing in local communities, seeking their trust and making a difference in their quality of their lives. The CSR concerns are getting embodied in the DNA, in the, or DNA of the corporations and the boundaries between the business and the community though has have got now blurred and become more permeable. Thus, social political issues inherent in global corporate citizenship cannot be ignored. The severe COVID-19 pandemic and also the conflict situation worldwide has brought forth the important role of CSR in survival of the worst affected persons. This is a new dimension that has emerged for CSR. In the words of Mahatma Gandhi, business entrepreneurs are trustees and not the owners of the social wealth. Now this is what he had indicated, dictated long time back that it was in his mind about the requirement of the social wealth being taken care of for the welfare of the society. And he said that they have to spend a part, part of it for social causes. To describe the principle of trusteeships, he had advocated the principle of trusteeship. He quoted that enjoy the wealth, take the minimum which you need, leave the rest for the welfare of the community. So you can see that this concept of corporate social responsibility was at the back of the mind uh, even during the Mahatma Gandhi's time and thereafter it progressed. Under trusteeship model, surplus wealth need to be kept in the trust of common good and welfare of others and thereby build sustainable livelihoods for all. Now, Gandhian thoughts, they have had profound impact on corporate social responsibility, not only in India, but also in many other countries in the world. The Companies Act 2013 has only disciplined the corporates on their regulative CSR expenditure and its proper and transparent financial audit, social audit, and compliance and disclosure model. In view of all the procedures being in place, the CSR activities have been regularly making impact on larger populations. Our observations have been that CSR has achieved an effective level of operation and is to have greater impact on socio-economic development of the poor and the needy people. Well, to tell you frankly, IOD is making very sincere efforts with the ministry to create expertise amongst corporates, social foundations, and experts to improve effectiveness in utilization of the CSR funds. And there is a considerable stress being laid on this aspect. Well, ladies and gentlemen, while the corporate sector is now well organized and doing, I would say, extremely well in looking after their social responsibilities. But we as individuals have also our individual social responsibilities. We must ensure that we keep our area neat and clean, 
And if we are in business of leak industry, pay particular attention to ensure that our activities don't have any adverse effect on the environment. We must also not compromise on ethics, on the quality of products, so that they don't have any adverse effects on the health of the consumers. This is our individual social responsibility. In this conference, I am sure that the participants would deliberate on all issues concerning CSR and derive maximum benefits from the international conference. I would like to thank all the participants, our distinguished guests who have come, and I wish all of you a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, General Nath. We appreciate your thoughts uh, and for explaining to us the tangible difference that CSR is making and can further make. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time now for our keynote address, and it is going to be delivered by someone who has continued to be a guiding light for the Institute of Directors. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Shailesh V. Haribhakti, FCA Board Chairman and Independent Director on multiple boards in India. Welcome, sir. My very distinguished colleagues on the dais, the wonderful assembly of ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great pleasure for us to be interacting on this extraordinarily important subject. I thought rather than cutting it in terms of the law and in terms of the process and the macros, which has been done so brilliantly already. I will just share with you my experience, uh, having been given the responsibility by uh, boards to chair the CSR committees uh, of the boards that I was a part of. And I'm going to draw my lessons from four sources. The first and primary source is the CSR committee of ACC, which had a fantastic DNA of the Tata group embedded in it. And it's amazing how strong the Tata group's cultural influences are, is on any organization that they have touched. So ACC is one source. The other is the Mahindra group, where we looked at establishing a permanent center at Terry to talk about sustainable ways of building, sustainable ways of actually housing people. Third is the healthcare uh, intervention, which I was very happy to see uh, has been a very major uh, part of the CSR spend. And this comes from my experience at Torrent Pharma, where we took on what I have now begun to nomenclature as innovation to zero. So what we decided to do is that in the few districts that we were active in, we will eliminate completely for all children the scourge of health effects of worms in their system. So deworming was a project that we actually successfully implemented through all completely comprehensive. So no child was left behind. Every child, no matter where, we, where they were, what stage of uh, economic level, whatever. And the fourth source is, sir, from Larson and Dubrow, where you are on the board, but I sit on the board of the Larson and Dubrow Finance Holdings, where I chair the CSR committee. And there we have a program which is addressing education, which I was very happy to see is uh, the largest spend on CSR. Uh, and there we took up a program 
of creating what are called digital sakhis. So we actually went and trained at scale women in rural India to become the teachers to other women across their villages and wherever they could spread the good, uh, good thought. And that has been such a phenomenal success and so transformative because it echoes the thought of becoming digitally enabled so brilliantly. And I'll start with a very poignant uh, story of my visit to one of the CSR sites of LNT Finance Holdings. And we were having a discussion, an informal discussion. And we said, what would happen if tomorrow all our microfinance lending will happen digitally? and you are required to repay digitally. So this wonderful woman who was in the audience, she rummaged through a purse, pulled out her smartphone, and told me that I use Google Pay. It is so stunning to see that the percolation of digital in rural India is so deep we find that the highest moral climate, the best moral climate in terms of the desire and the actual execution of paying every rupee back on time happens in rural India. Sir, you'll be all happy to know that in rural India, our collection record is over 99.7%. Nobody fails to pay on time. And this is one of the impacts of this digital Sakhi program and the whole idea that if you are empowered digitally, you can continue along your, uh, to follow your moral compass and make sure that you are part of a community which not only takes the benefit of what is available, but shares it. And what we find is that this creating of these circles of sharing, these huge ecosystems of sharing, is perhaps the greatest delivery of CSR. And all you wonderful people who are engaged in this activity should think about creating this massive ripple effect of making sure that what you touch touches a large number of human beings. The extent of need in our country is just enormous. The mind boggles. One lakh crores is nothing. We can absorb multiple times that number to just bring people up to a par level. But let me extract from these four wonderful organizations the key principles that the board wanted to make sure the CSR committee follows. So the first attempt was to make sure that there is an appropriate structure. It is very important not to treat CSR as a uh, side activity. Because we must remember that the evolution that is taking place is CSR is evolving into ESG, is evolving into sustainability. And that is why it is very important that the appropriate structure and the appropriate remit for the CSR Stroke Sustainability Committee is actually set in place at the very beginning. That is crucial. The committee can then focus on what it is that will truly deliver the massive impact that CSR is supposed to deliver. It also makes sure that the spending, sir, as you rightly pointed out, goes for the benefit of the community. So that's the first principle. So we made sure that there is a proper foundation, a Section 8 company, a 
uh, a trust or whatever was the appropriate structure. And that structure needs to be properly manned. The same level of rigor that you have in procurement, which is perhaps the highest risk item, must apply to CSR and sustainability. This is crucially important. The risk management in CSR has to be of the highest quality. Only then will you deliver the results and you will make sure that the spend happens. Next, choose people of outstanding capability and great heart and soul, totally dependent the organization will be on the leadership that is provided. If the leadership in the CSR space is high quality, you will see that the impact is absolutely phenomenal. And this is what we saw in every organization. Next comes the idea of echoing your ability to spend. Each one of these four organizations that I talked to you about have reached out to the rest of India and will draw in contributions from other companies which want to fulfill the similar purpose. This is a very crucial thing to echo your one rupee and make it 10 if you can. That is crucial. Finally, very important to measure the impact and feed it back both to your committee and to the board. But the best thing that all of you can do is to actually create very powerful video, audio, OTT type content to show the impact of your CSR activities. I'll stop because I know I've run out of time. There's a film that we made at ACC, which is still up on the internet. Uh, we have a plant in a very small town called Maddukurai. And there is this young person, eight-year-old person, who talks about why her Maddukurai is heaven on earth. I would request all of you to draw it down and have a look at it. It's a five, six minute film, which will tell you what community involvement and involvement of the company's people can bring together in terms of astonishing results. We have converted Madhukurai into a clean place. Every home has a gamla or some green, vermiculture, composting, huge amount of cleanliness, deep reduction in the uh, poor health conditions, fantastic education, all children go to school. Every woman believes that she is well occupied. They took up the garbage collection, separation, all of that voluntarily and transformed this one place. I would request all of you to have a look at that and take the lessons from it. What it involves is deep engagement. What it involves is being there to make sure that the impact truly happens. Thank you very much and wish you all the best in your conference. Thank you very much, Mr. Haribhakti. I'm quite certain that it's not just me, but many of us sitting here are deeply inspired by your words. And we can learn from your very rich experience, uh, most importantly, of not just uh, planning, but effectively actioning and engaging on the ground. So thank you, sir. We are inspired by your words. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving on to our special address. And for that, uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Vijay Karya, Chairman and MD Ravan Group of Companies India, one of Asia's fastest growing electrical uh, equipments uh, companies. 
Uh, Mr. Karya, as chairman and managing director of Rabin Group, uh, has been instrumental in leading the electrical cable segment in many ways. He has been a pioneer and the group uh, is the largest exporter of cables from India. He is the first Indian cable manufacturing company to set up its manufacturing facility overseas in the UAE. We are, of course, delighted to have you with us, uh, Mr. Karya, today. And uh, we must mention here that uh, he is uh, a very uh, close friend of the IOD for many, many years now. And his entrepreneurial wisdom is something that continues to inspire us. Welcome, sir. We look forward to your words. Very good morning, everybody. Uh, very good morning to all my distinguished colleagues on the dais. And uh, I must uh, say out here a very warm welcome to Lieutenant General Surendranath for taking over the presidentship of IOD from Lieutenant General Alawalia, uh, who led IOD very ably for a very long time. Uh, I'm sure Lieutenant General Surendranath, who was I believe a colleague of uh, Lieutenant General Alawalia in the army will fill in the large shoes very ably. So all the very best sir, to you. I, I think uh, speaking about CSR in front of all the distinguished people and especially after the address of uh, Shri Ashok Kapoor and Lieutenant General Surendranath and my friend Sailesh Haribhakti. It's very difficult to uh, come and, you know, bat when already the three top opening batsmen have scored centuries or double centuries. But uh, we'll, I'll take forward what they all said. Uh, first of all, we believe that CSR. And let's move away from the compulsion and the law and the necessity of implementing a CSR, which I believe was implemented in India from effectively from 1st of April 2014. Uh, corporate social responsibility is not just about paying money. It's about responsibility as a whole. All of y'all know the responsibility of raising children, of growing organizations, of nurturing various uh, societies or even the companies. And that just doesn't mean pumping in money. But as uh, Shri Ashok Kapoorji said, it's also about devoting time. And I think uh, it's high time now that we start looking to how much time we are devoting to uh, CSR activity rather than just looking at it in monetary terms. Because I'm sure everybody understands that having a child and paying an ayah or a servant thousands of rupees to take care of the child will not bring you the same results as you nurturing the child yourself and therefore what Shri Ashok Kapoor said makes a lot of sense and I wish that this matter comes in because we do it in schools. In schools, there is a compulsion on social service. Then there is a compulsion of going to villages or going out and doing duty. It's not about money. It's about the time spent and it's about how you nurture the minds. A small example, very relevant to CSR is uh, what is one of the largest events going on in Ahmedabad today. And that is by the BAPS Swaminarayan Trust where on over 600 acres of land, they've developed a Nagar. Unfortunately, that event ends in next couple of days. Otherwise, I would have urged a lot of people to go there and see. I have been there a number of times. I've been closely associated with that. A small example of CSR is that there are 1, 20, 1 crore 25 lakh paver blocks 
installed on 600 acres of land. Those 1 crore 25 lakh paver blocks have not been installed by any contractor. They have been installed by the Swamis who are part of the Swaminarayan Trust and they have been installed by volunteers. As we speak, there are about 85,000 volunteers who take care of the entire setup as well as of running the program seamlessly. I'm told yesterday there were about 9 lakh people uh, on that site. I was there day before yesterday. The small children, there is a Bal Nagri where there are about 1500 children, all below the age of 14. And I was shocked, shocked in the sense that pleasantly shocked to see the clarity, to see the way the children were taking care of guiding people, of seeing how to move, of seeing, of giving them the history. And this is what CSR is about. CSR is about passing on a legacy. It is not just about spending money, but it's what your organization does. It's far beyond just doing good for the present moment. It is doing good for sustainable future, as uh, Mr. Salesh Haribhakti said. Sustainability is the core of CSR. Most of the organizations we see that they spend money, yes, but they don't spend time on it. Their employees are not engaged in it. And therefore, one of the important things, and this is where the board's leadership comes in, that if your school or colleges has a leadership which actually participates in the social service that the children do and just not make it mandatory that because you have to do these many hours of social service, stand in some villages or go to some villages, go in a air-conditioned car and you know sit and take care of yourself first before you take care of others. CSR is about taking care of others first before you do it for yourself. This will also result in organizations retaining their employees because after all, more than money, it is the employees who are attached emotionally to the organization, to the ideals of the organization. And therefore, I say that organizations should build their core strategies in CSR around employee engagement and not merely a 2% of their profits. It's very easy to give money. It's more difficult to create that employee engagement and that will lead to a sustainable future. That also means that in terms of compliances, in terms of statutory compliances, you will be a lot more honest you will be a lot more uh, straightforward in reporting facts because your DNA has been set at doing something which is good. Your employee's DNA is set towards doing something which is for the social good and not just for money. And employment or engagement of people, honestly, and somebody told me this, that the kind of money that you require is just a glass. You pour water in, once the glass gets full, that is your requirement. You pour more water in, it goes waste. You don't require it. Therefore, it is essential that organizations build CSR and they build their strategies of CSR around what are the core competencies of the organization, what they do. I have seen a lot of companies who are into X business, but they put their CSR spend into something very diverse. This is not connected or where there is a clear mandate that you try and do CSR in the best way around your own areas, because that is where you can make the maximum of impact. We as an organization started our CSR activities far, far, far before mandated in 2014. We started somewhere in 1999, I think. And we started creating scholarships 
for uh, people the small uh, school of 40 people uh, 40 children uh, near where one of our factories in pune is and uh, that school had 40 children and we started the scholarships out there today that school has 2300 children in a short span of time but more importantly when we started the scholarship the first scholarships that we gave four boys won it and last time when we gave the scholarships there were again four boys that won it but the difference is that there were a total of four in the first one and there were a total of 83 in the last one so that means 79 were girls and what changed and this uh, has been also part of an initiative done by the times of india and that school was covered and those people were covered people were refusing to send their children the send especially the girls to school why are kya karegi wo you know she has to take care of the house she has to take care of the family she has to ensure that uh, she takes care of her brother she feeds them well the brothers will go to school the lazy bums they won't work and this poor girl was not allowed to get educated we started a door to door campaign and that's where a lot of my people contributed to this that we started this door to door campaign and asked these people why they were not sending their girls so very reluctantly some of them sent the girls fortunately one of the girls uh, who got a scholarship she went on to become a chartered accountant and she opened up a institution in the village for tuitions and training of these children and suddenly where these people's income was only from farming tripled because of this institution that this girl opened up and this was covered in one of the stories in on television and with this one spark the village got enlightened and a lot of people uh, visited i mean started going to school and the result is today 79 girls get scholarships now this is where that spark and this is where what organization should look to do is create that spark it's easy to give money and just couple of examples that uh, you know we talk of csr and just yesterday i met uh, somebody who told me and of course a lot a lot of us are very spiritual and very devoted and we visit either the temples or the mosques or the churches and for us our measure of devotion is how much of money we put into the box the more money you put in and that is how we have a lot of these temples you know earning so much of money the more money we put into the box the more is our devotion it's measured in terms of monetary gains i met one old gentleman was barely able to walk and i met him at one of the large temples in mumbai and the fellow was inside there was a lot of crowd so i tried to arrange that you know he could get a proper darshan and when he came out with me that flower seller out there you know the fellow he had taken a basket from him the fellow asked him how much so this fellow said 50 rupees or something he gave that fellow 100 rupees and said you keep it that for me is csr i asked that gentleman that he asked for 50 you gave him 100 he's telling me son i put 100 rupees in the devotion in my box out there so therefore that 100 rupees i gave to this person so that i don't differentiate between the god's offering and the human offering there is another gentleman i keep on meeting who goes to a lot of places he goes to a lot of temples but he carries a huge bag he comes from somewhere in vasai virar mira road somewhere carries a huge bag the fellow is not at all rich you can make out because he comes by bus he carries that bag he goes back by bus and in that bag 
he carries dog food, cat food, he carries milk and feeds all those three animals out there. And that for me is CSR. And I would like that we inculcate as a board, because this is where the leadership counts. As a board, I would like that we inculcate the sense of belonging, the sense of responsibility, that it is not about the money that you put in, but it is about the effort that you put in and making sure that your pipeline is reaching the person who requires mm -hmm. that water. On this note, I will end. I've taken up a lot of time, but thank you very much for a patient listening and very happy and very engaging talks for the next couple of days. My congratulations to IOD once again for organizing this grand and very, very effective and implementable, but more importantly, a very responsible event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Your words where you said CSR is a legacy is certainly something that all leaders need to think hard about. Ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to our next special address. And for that, we are very pleased to welcome Mr. Sundara Raman Ramamurthy, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, BSC Limited. Mr. Ramamurthy recently took over as MD and CEO of BSC. And on behalf of the Institute of Directors, a heartfelt congratulations to you, sir. And we wish you the very best for your tenure here. Mr. Ramamurthy is a highly motivated leader and consistent performer with a successful track record of 38 years and a strong passion to lead financial institutions and motivate teams. Welcome, sir. We look forward to your address. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me here, Ivody, and uh, great dignitaries on the dais. I've shared a lot of good views already to all of you. A belated, uh, happy, prosperous, and healthy new year from my side. And uh, I represent, uh, I'm very proud to be here representing Bombay Stock Exchange, Asia's oldest stock exchange. Today, India is in a cusp where we are very proudly talking about a three trillion economy becoming a five trillion economy and very soon becoming a seven trillion economy. This type of an economic growth certainly comes from a significant level of contribution from the corporates. Corporates do act as a wealth building mechanism. Along with it, they also should do a nation building is what CSR is all about. The corporate success is not by in itself. It is because the society supports the corporates, the corporates succeed. And therefore, there is clearly a reason and responsibility for the corporates to give back to the society where from they get the support through which they are not only nation wealth building, but they are also nation building. These all look very simple for all of us to sort of understand. This is nothing new in what we are talking about. Corporates thriving on the trust, goodwill, and confidence of the society, and therefore there is a need for them to give back to the society, is well understood. But what is a corporate? Corporate typically is the leadership. It was already mentioned as to how leadership is important in ensuring and percolating the CSR thought process down the lane. The corporate is represented by the board. Yatha Raja Tatha Praja. If the board has in itself that moral fiber of CSR embedded that get passed on to the last employee. That's how inclusion happens. So what do we mean by inclusion? Let me tell a story from Mahabharata. It may look like a wee bit of an exaggeration, but if you don't exaggerate, many times you don't communicate. By magnifying, you make a small point to become better visible, right? Raja Yudhishthir, the, the eldest brother of Pandavas, conducted Rajasuya Yajna. It's a sacrifice. At the end of the sacrifice, it is the duty of the king to distribute his wealth amongst others. One of the major reasons for this stipulation is to ensure 
wealth distribution and avoidance of social inequalities in terms of wealth distribution. That was a fundamental principle. So when we give, we typically get a sense of being slightly high and we think that we have done something great. Yudhishthir, the embodiment of virtues, also got that feeling. Then suddenly a mongoose entered the place where this distribution is happening. And it was a unique mongoose for two, re two reasons. One, it was talking. And second, one side of it was golden. The mongoose said, Yudhishthir, you think that you are doing a great job. Let me test whether you are really doing a great job and certify. People were appalled. The mongoose suddenly uh, went and uh, rubbed its other side of the body on the ground where this was happening. And then looked at the other side and said, oh, no, not great. Nothing good. The king was humble. So he asked, what do you mean by what you say? Indeed, it is true that I felt that I'm doing a great job. You, you clearly uh, burst the balloon of my ego. So if you say this is not a great job, you tell me what is the great job and how one part of your body became golden. To cut a long story short, the mongoose said, there is a family in your kingdom. It's a very poor family. It comprises of six people, the grandfather, grandmother, father, mother, sister, brother. Sister, brother naturally are young kids. In that fashion, the age grows. They were very poor. They did not have anything to eat, which is one another information to the king. You know what? You think that you have made social distribution and all? No, there are people who are hungry in your kingdom. And that fellow did not have anything to eat one day. So he went and collected wild rice from the forest and made some flour out of it, which they thought they will mix with water and have it as food. They were hungry for two days. At the time, they heard a knock in their door and they found an old man, very poor, was telling that he's hungry for four days and he has not eaten anything. And whether this family could share. Actually, whatever limited wild rice flour they have made, they are divided into six parts, thinking that they will eat. Every one of the family thought that they will contribute their portion first. The mother said that it is my duty to take care of children that I will contribute my portion. The, the grandmother, the grandfather said, no, no, I am the head of the family. I should first contribute. Then the daughter-in-law said, no, no, I have come into this home to safeguard my people. So I should give. The husband said, no, no, I got you into this house. So I'm, it's my responsibility. The children said, your parents, you all cannot sustain because of old health, your hunger. It is my duty to give my share. And it so happened with one portion, that man who came was not satiated. All the six of them gave their share. The mongoose, which was watch watching all this, found and whatever dribbles that were there left on the floor when that old man was eating, it rubbed its one side and it became golden. So the mango said, that is donation. That is philanthropy. That is giving away. What you are doing now is not giving away. So multiple morals I get out of this story. One is, think about the thought process. The king thinks that he should distribute his wealth. A man who is very poor, who has no wealth to distribute, also thinks about distributing and finds a needy. Somebody amongst my co-speakers talked about there is no need for money to be had for you to distribute. It's a question of intention that you should have. Where it comes from, importance of leadership. So coming back to the responsibility of the board. So the board as a responsible corporate leader needs to set the tone. It was very well mentioned in the speech made before. If you want to have some CSR strategy, which is in no way dovetailing with your organizational strategy, maybe it will not work. Or to put it differently, all the boards and all the corporates sit together to evolve a strategy, what they will be doing the next few years, and they have a plan for the coming year. Unless and until there is a fiber of CSR embedded into that strategy, it's not going to work. As much as the corporate strategy is important, the corporate strategy embedding the CSR strategy in itself is very important. That is one way by which inclusion happens. When inclusion happens, it is every employee, every stakeholder, everybody in the system is appreciative of it and they participate and they benefit. How? Giving is also benefiting. 
the happiness that you derive by giving is more than the happiness in even getting it. Many of us, even when we donate two rupees or five rupees with nothing in return expected, we find that happiness. That happiness is the driving motivation that what is need to be showcased, echoing success, as somebody mentioned, is therefore very important. important. Organizations are juggernaut. Policy is made at some level. The implementation it at some other level. So it is very important to monitor repeatedly whether the implementation is as per the expectation, if not to do course correction. That is another important point we should bear in mind. Organizations also strive hard in order to include people. So what is the best way? Audio visual, audio visual things, spreading messages, making people to come and share their experiences. These are all small, small things. These are very important. This is how you spread the message. How do you echo it? Collaborate with multiple other organizations, government agencies, NGOs, people who are in the distribution model. I'm sure the message will spread. Every one of us try to do whatever limited that we can by doing in whatever is in our hands. CSR to meaningfully to contribute to the national goals and economic and social development in India. Companies do have a very, very important role to play. Therefore, boards have a very, very important role in that area in driving it. My time is almost getting over. I have 25 seconds. I will take that time for thanking IOD for having me here, notwithstanding the fact I'm just a week old in my new post. Thank you, everybody, for your patient hearing. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Ramamurthy. You've certainly connected with the audience uh, here today. And thank you for explaining that CSR is about having a multi-pronged approach. Uh, and it's not just about having the money, but spending it effectively. Ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to our next keynote address. And for that, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Mr. Shishir Bajaj, Bajaj Group Patriarch and Chairman of the Bajaj Foundation. A very warm welcome to you, sir. He is, of course, sir, one of India's most respected businessmen. Mr. Bajaj joined the Bajaj Group of Companies in 1974 and served in a number of key positions, growing the uh, group's business imprint and diversifying its interests as well. We are thrilled to have you with us, sir, and we look forward to your address. Welcome. Hello. Shri Ashok Kapoor, Director General, Institute of Directors, Lieutenant General Surinder Nath, President, Institute of Directors, Shailesh, Mr. Shailesh Haribhakti, who's my very close friend, Chairman of the Board, I am first of all really thankful to all of you, sir, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak in front of this August gathering. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to state how and where and why we started the CSR activities. Friends, as we all know, Gandhiji fought his nonviolence struggle to make India independent from Vardha, where he stayed from 1936 to 1946. Also, Vardha has been the karma bhumi of my grandfather, Sri Jamnalal Bajaj, who was fully involved with practically all the activities of Gandhiji. Also, karma bhumi of my father, Kamalayan Bajaj. Hence, our CSR activities were started some 12 years back in Vardha under the banner of Kamal Nain Jamnalal Bajaj Foundation. We are today working in the entire district of Varda, covering approximately 1,000 villages. 
In addition, we are also working in the district of Sikar, district in Rajasthan, where my grandfather Jamnalal Bajaj was born. There we are working in around 500 villages and we propose to cover the entire district of Sikar of 1100 villages in another four to five years. Our CSR activities are also being done around the neighboring villages of our 2000 megawatt power plant in Uttar Pradesh. <laughs> Incidentally, we are the largest producer of thermal power in the private sector in Uttar Pradesh, generating about 2500 megawatt of power. Also CSR activities are being undertaken in our 14 sugar factories in Bajaj Hindustan Sugar, again in Uttar Pradesh. We are incidentally the largest producer of sugar in India and with six distilleries, the largest producer of ethanol in India. We all know ethanol is a green fuel and eco-friendly and is a great saver of foreign exchange. And hence we propose to enhance the production of ethanol substantially in the coming years. Also about five lakh farmers and crores of lives are <clears throat> benefit directly in our sugar sector. Coming to the water activities in Varda and Sikar. In the last 10 years in Varda, we have connected 245 dead river and small streams with a total length of 700 kilometers to the main Varda River, Vana River and Dham Rivers. Basically, what is the meaning of re rejuvenating of rivers? We, these 250 rivers were dead, absolutely dead. We deepened them and widened them and joined with the main two, three big rivers so that the main the water from the main rivers trickled down to these small uh, uh, dead rivers and then they spread all over the land in addition to this we have constructed check dams farm ponds recharge pits wells recharge roof rain harvesting structures group wells lift irrigation drip and sprinkler irrigation farm ponds etc because of these interventions, three lakh acres of land have been covered under the above water management system in the last 12 years. I am further very happy to state that just recently, we have signed an MOU with the Maharashtra government of further re rejuvenating 450 dead rivers and streams in Varda district with a total length of 1700 kilometers. This will irrigate 5 lakh acres of land in the next five years. Again, about 550 villages will be benefited. This scheme will be uh, completed, of course, in uh, five years. And by doing this, the entire Varda district in the next five years will be free of any water scarcity. Before these interventions, as we know, Varda is in Varda. Vidharba district and this district was prone to suicides because of fragmented land holdings, low yields and outdated farming techniques. Now with our interventions, small interventions and the further interventions which will take place in the next five years, the farmers will be able to take three crops and the earnings will also increase substantially. With all these things, about 4 lakh families and 20 lakh population will be benefited. In the agriculture area, we have taken initiatives in Better Cotton Initiative, Wadi Project, Natural Farming, shifting of traditional crop patterns to modern, modern marketing techniques, setting up farmers, producers, organization, with these, with these interventions in the last so many years, about 1.6 lakh acres of land have improved in the last 10 years. We have also 
managed to construct myriads of biogas plants given solar lights, solar pumps in the rural areas. Regarding women empowerment, we have created thousands of self-help groups, helped small enterprises, and helped needy families, and with and increased the income generation activities of the downtrodden. Also helped skill and entrepreneur development for the youth. And also uh, we collaborated with the Riverside School of Ahmedabad for the design for change uh, experiment for the students. In Seeker district in Rajasthan, as we all also know that Rajasthan is water, there is a lot of water scarcity in Rajasthan, which is a major challenge. The average depth of two well in Rajasthan is through 350 feet to maximum 700 feet. People, to get water, you have to go down 700 feet. I mean, it's a real challenge. Looking into that, we felt and we are now recharging the existing wells through rainwater harvesting, which has given good results. From this year onwards, in our total group, we are spending about 150 crores annually and we are partnering up and we are ha having partnership with the government of Maharashtra, government of Rajasthan and the government of Uttar Pradesh. Also, we have partnered with the National Bank of Agriculture and Rural Development, NABAD. Also, we have partnered with some of the private sector foundations and the Riverside School, Ahmedabad for the design for change. Uh, basically, uh, one more story I would like to state. Uh, in 1932, Gandhiji request, at, at that time, sugar was being imported in the country. And Gandhiji requested my grandfather, Jamnalalji, Ki Jamnalal, why don't you start and producing sugar? Of course, nobody could sort of say no to Gandhiji. So my grandfather started in a very small way. To, and that was the first venture of the Bajaj group. At that time, there was nothing. Bajaj Group was not existing. That was the first small sugar factory in Lakhimpur district in Uttar Pradesh 90 years back. And uh, I am happy to state that in these 90 years, about 600 people retired after serving 25 years. And 300 people retired after serving 35 years. And two people retired after serving 50 years. Basically, Basically, we are treating our workers and staff not as employees, but as extended family members. We try to give them a better quality of life. And that is very important. And uh, I'm sure we all agree that we have to give to the society as narrated in the Gita without expecting any return. And that's what we are trying to do in our own little bit. I would really invite all of you, if you can visit Varda and Seeker and see for yourself whatever little bit we are trying to do. With these few words, I wish you all a very good 23 and a wonderful future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Bajaj, for detailing the scope uh, and the detail of the work that your foundation is doing. It's commendable, it's inspiring, and it certainly builds on the powerful legacy of your family. Most importantly, the details that he shared with us uh, showed us that there is a tangible impact. People's lives are being made better every day, and that is exactly what CSR is all about. So thank you very much indeed, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the inaugural session of uh, this conference. A big thank you to all our esteemed speakers. And I'd like to now request uh, General Surinder Nath to kindly present the IOD Memento to all our esteemed guests.
Thank you for your presence today, Mr. Bajaj. Thank you very much again, Mr. Ramamurthy, for being here today. A token of our thanks for Mr. Karia as well. Thank you, sir. And special thanks once again to Mr. Shailesh V. Hari Bhakti. I'd like to request all our speakers to please uh, come to the center of the stage uh, for a quick photo op. Requesting all our speakers to just uh, come center of the stage for a quick photo op. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for all our speakers, for their insights and the inspiring words that they have shared with us this morning. Thank you very much indeed. And with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a very, very short uh, tea and coffee break. Request your presence back in about 20 minutes from now. We'll see you at 1130. Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience this morning. Thank you. पहले जहां किसान कर्जे में रहकर खेती करते थे क्योंकि रासायनिक खेती में लागत अधिक और मुनाफा ना के बराबर होता था हर वर्ष ये कर्जा बढ़ता ही रहता था कृषि संकट से जूझते हुए किसानों के जीवन में संपन्नता स्थैर्य और समृद्धि की राह साबित हो रही है प्राकृतिक कृषि पद्धति कमल ने जमनालाल बजाज फाउंडेशन के 10 वर्षों की मेहनत और लगन की ये सफलता की कहानी सबसे पहले विभिन्न किसान सम्मेलन कार्यशाला तथा शिवार फेरियों के आयोजन से प्राकृतिक खेती पद्धति की जन जागृति की गई पद्मश्री सुभाष पालेकर गुरु जी स्वयं इन कार्यक्रमों में सहभागी होकर किसानों को मार्गदर्शन करते उनकी समस्याओं को सुनते और शंकाओं का समाधान करते इस कार्यक्रम में चौहत्तर हजार किसानों को प्रशिक्षित किया गया जिसमें से ग्यारह हजार एक सौ साठ किसानों ने प्राकृतिक खेती पद्धति को अपनाया है तीन सौ पैतीस गाँव में पांच हजार पांच सौ चौरानवे एकड़ खेत जमीन पर प्राकृतिक कृषि पद्धति से खेती हो रही है छब्बीस प्रकार की विविध स्वदेशी प्रजातियों को इस पद्धति में बढ़ावा दिया गया विभिन्न तथा मिश्र फसल पद्धति से अन्य सुरक्षा को बढ़ावा मिला है किसान उत्पादक कंपनियों की स्थापना से किसानों का आत्मविश्वास और जीवन स्तर दोनों ही बढ़ रहा है किसानों को बाजार में पकड़ तथा अधिक मुनाफा मिल सके इस उद्देश्य से धान्य महोत्सव का आयोजन तथा मोबाइल आउटलेट से सहायता दी गई वर्धा जिला प्रशासन का सहयोग कमल नयन जमनालाल बजाज फाउंडेशन का अविरत प्रयास और किसानों का आत्मविश्वास इन सारे घटकों से कृषि प्रधान देश भारत के भविष्य की एक सुंदर तस्वीर आकार ले रही है पहले जहां किसान कर्जे में रहकर खेती I was very happy that you took over, you know. Okay. 
नमस्कार मेरा नाम मेहरदीप नरेंद्र सहारे मैं एक नैसर्गिक फार्मर हूँ और यहाँ पे नई तरीके से नेचुरल खेती करता हूँ और एम करने के बाद मैंने कॉर्पोरेट जगत में तीन साल जॉब किया उसके बाद मुझे लगा कि ये मेरा कप ऑफ टी नहीं है जॉब नहीं करनी है मुझे पहले से जिसमें इंटरेस्ट था फार्मिंग में उसमें ही आना है उसमें भी सिर्फ केमिकल फ्री फार्मिंग करनी थी मुझे ये ऑर्गेनिक ना होते हुए नेचुरल खेती यहाँ पे हम जो करते हैं मल्टी क्रॉप पैटर्न के साथ इसको करते हैं जैसे यहाँ पे दिख रहा है हमें कि हमने चना लगाया है उस साइड पे हम बाटाना देख सकते हैं उसके बाद धनिया है तो यहाँ पे कर रहे हैं ये सारी जो चीजें है नेचुरल पद्धति से बनाते हैं जैसे क्या करते हैं यहाँ पे हम खेतों में जो आजू बाजू नेचर में हमारे पास अवेलेबल चीजें उससे हम यहाँ पे चीजें बनाते हैं जैसे कि घन जीवाम जीवाम दशपर्णी अर्क ये सारी चीजें हम यहाँ पे खुद बनाते हैं और उनका ही सिर्फ यूज करते हैं इससे होता क्या है कि पूरी तरह से केमिकल फ्री विश मुक्त अन्न यहाँ पे खाने के लिए हमें मिलता है ऐसी छोटी बड़ी बहुत सी ऐसी चीजें हैं जो बजाज फाउंडेशन हमें मदद करता रहता है खेती वालों को मदद करता रहता है और इसके वजह से हम मोटिवेटेड होते रहते हैं और इसके लिए मैं इनको धन्यवाद कहना चाहता हूँ
आठ मई 2022 के पूरी दुनिया में मदर्स डे मनाया जा रहा है ये पूरा दिन हम अपनी माँ को समर्पित कर रहे हैं लेकिन क्या हमारी सिर्फ जन्म देने वाली एक ही माँ होती है हम जितने भी मनुष्य इस दुनिया में हैं, जितने भी जीव जंतु जानवर पंछी हैं, हम सभी की एक और माँ है जिसे हम धरती माता कहते हैं और आज के समय में सबसे महत्वपूर्ण बात है अपनी धरती माता के बारे में सोचकर उसे बचाने के लिए कार्य करना खेती में लगातार इतने वर्षों से रासायनिक उर्वरकों का उपयोग होने से धरती माता को क्षति पहुंची है इसका कारगर उपाय है प्राकृतिक खेती पद्धति को अपनाना धरती माता के साथ ही हमारी एक और माता है जो है गौ माता गौ माता से मिलने वाला गौमूत्र गोबर इनका उपयोग करके हम कम हेलो चेयरमैन लोकेशन प्लीज इनेबल योर ऑडियो एंड वीडियो वी हैव टू डू टू मिनट टेस्टिंग चेयरमैन एन एफ आर एन रिक्वेस्टिंग यू प्लीज इनेबल योर ऑडियो एंड वीडियो फॉर द टेस्टिंग हेलो कैन यू हियर मी या वन मिनट वन मिनट या चेकिंग जस्ट इट्स लाउड एंड क्लियर हेलो साउंड इज ओके यस यस वी कैन हियर यू हेलो 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 नहीं आवाज आ रही हेलो हेलो नहीं आवाज आ रही आ रही है आपकी आवाज हेलो हेलो या आई कैन हियर यू हेलो कैन यू हियर मी यस सर कैन यू हियर मी यस सर लाउड एंड क्लियर Okay, so now, uh, so I will join at eleven thirty. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Fine, sir. Fine, sir. After ten. Let's pray. After seven minutes. After seven minutes. Seven to ten minutes. Okay. ठीक है. Okay. All right. So I will put this on the mute then. Sure, sir. Huh? Yeah. Mute. आठ मई 2022 को पूरी दुनिया में मदर्स डे मनाया जा रहा है ये पूरा दिन हम अपनी माँ को समर्पित करते हैं लेकिन क्या हमारी सिर्फ जन्म देने वाली एक ही माँ होती है हम जितने भी मनुष्य इस दुनिया में हैं, जितने भी जीव जंतु जानवर पंछी हैं, हम सभी की एक और माँ है जिसे हम धरती माता कहते हैं और आज के समय में सबसे महत्वपूर्ण बात है अपनी धरती माता के बारे में सोचकर उसे बचाने के लिए कार्य करना खेती में लगातार इतने वर्षों से रासायनिक उर्वरकों का उपयोग होने से धरती माता को क्षति पहुंची है इसका कारगर उपाय है प्राकृतिक खेती पद्धति को अपनाना धरती माता के साथ ही हमारी एक और माता है जो है गौ माता गौ माता से मिलने वाला गौमूत्र गोबर इनका उपयोग करके 
हम कम लागत वाली प्राकृतिक खेती करके उपज को अधिक पौष्टिक बना सकते हैं वर्धा जिले के समुद्रपुर तालुका के भूमन खेड़ा इस गांव का ये चिड़े परिवार गौ माता की सेवा करके धरती माता का भी पोषण कर रहा है बारह एकड़ की इनकी संपूर्ण खेती प्राकृतिक पद्धति से होती है ऐसे परिवारों की देश और दुनिया को आवश्यकता है आइए अब मदर स्लेक को नई दृष्टि से देखें और नए तरीकों से बनाएं। नमस्कार मेरा नाम मेहरदूत धरेंद्र सहारे मैं एक नैसर्गिक फार्मर हूँ और यहाँ पे नई तरीके से नेचुरल खेती करता हूँ और एम करने के बाद मैंने कॉर्पोरेट जगत में तीन साल जॉब किया उसके बाद मुझे लगा कि ये मेरा कप ऑफ टी नहीं है जॉब नहीं करनी है मुझे पहले से जिसमें इंटरेस्ट था फार्मिंग में उसमें ही आना है उसमें भी सिर्फ केमिकल फ्री फार्मिंग करनी थी मुझे ये ऑर्गेनिक ना होते हुए नेचुरल खेती यहाँ पे हम जो बनेश है मल्टी क्रॉप पैटर्न के साथ इसको करते हैं जैसे यहाँ पे दिख रहा है हमें कि हमने चना लगाया है उस साइड पे हम बाटाना देख सकते हैं उसके बाद धनिया है गेहूं है ये मल्टी क्रॉप पैटर्न में हम यहाँ पे कर रहे हैं ये सारी जो चीजें है नेचुरल पद्धति से बनाते हैं जैसे क्या करते हैं यहाँ पे हम खेतों में जो आजू बाजू नेचर में हमारे पास अवेलेबल चीजें हो उससे हम यहाँ पे चीजें बनाते हैं जैसे कि घने जीवाम जीवाम दश पर नहीं अर्क ये सारी चीजें हम यहाँ पे खुद बनाते हैं और उनका ही सिर्फ यूज करते हैं इससे होता क्या है कि पूरी तरह से केमिकल फ्री विष मुक्त अन्न यहाँ पे खाने के लिए हमें मिलता है ऐसी छोटी बड़ी बहुत सी ऐसी चीजें है जो बजाज फाउंडेशन हमें मदद करता रहता है खेती वाल
on the property. Point of time, the soldier would be fully fit, and at one point, moment, he suppose a gunshot. His life changed. In three years, BFC transformed. Our public service contract uh, is one entity that is to be arranged in time. और जो फाउंडर पार्टनर की तरह हम लोगों के साथ ताज रहा है उस समय से अभी तक हम लोगों का ताज के साथ ऐसा ही संबंध है और साथ में मिल के हम लोग घाट का सौंदर्यीकरण और गंगा की स्वच्छता सफाई के लिए हम लोग लगभग तीन दशक से साथ मिल के काम कर रहे हैं Across our hotels, we focus on local sourcing and use local produce to create authentic experiences. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that let success soar high. I will perform. I will outrank. I will achieve. trusted bank I am the I in SBI SBI I the banker the to every indian I am the blue of the limitless sky I am the inspiration that let success so
nation's trusted bank. SBI, the banker to every Indian. पहले जहां किसान कर्जे में रहकर खेती करते थे क्योंकि रासायनिक खेती में लागत अधिक और मुनाफा ना के बराबर होता था हर वर्ष ये कर्जा बढ़ता ही रहता था कृषि संकट से जूझते हुए किसानों के जीवन में संपन्नता स्थैर्य और समृद्ध Ladies and gentlemen, good morning once again. We will be beginning the proceedings uh, in just a couple of minutes, requesting you uh, to please take your seats. so that we can stay on schedule for this conference thank you very much kindly take your seats iron finance limited aapki pragati ka sathi
such a high amount of endemism on these islands because of our geographical isolation from the mainland. So there are plants and animals that you only see on these islands and nowhere else in the world. The Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen, requesting you all to uh, kindly settle down, take your seats. We hope you've been aptly refreshed uh, by the beverages outside. And it's been a good break of networking and speaking with like-minded people. Requesting you all to please kindly take your seats. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you back uh, into the conference as we move towards uh, the plenary keynote session. This is the second keynote session. And of course, it focuses on both strategy in making CSR inclusive. First of all, I'd like to invite a very distinguished speaker and the chairperson for this uh, plenary keynote session. Please put your hands together for Mr. Nasser M. Munji, chairman. Tata Motors Finance Limited, board chairman and independent director on multiple boards in India. Friends, during his long and distinguished career, he has been a part of the creation and building of some of India's foremost financial institutions. Currently, he is on the board of several public companies in India, such as Cummins India, Tata Motors Finance and the Indian Hotels Company. And of course, he is also associated uh, with international institutions like Jaguar Land Rover, PLC UK, Green Co Mauritius, Advisory Group of City of London, and the Executive Committee of the World Islamic Economic Forum. We are delighted to have you with us, sir. Please join us on stage to chair this session. A warm welcome to you. I'd also like to now invite on stage our distinguished speakers for this session. First, uh, our guest is joining us virtually from Delhi, and that's Dr. Ajay Bhushan Prasad Pandey, IAS retired, Chairman, National Financial Reporting Authority, and a former Finance Secretary, Government of India. Dr. Pandey is an officer of the Indian Administrative Services 1984 batch. He has been responsible for preparing not one, not two, but three annual budgets for the Government of India in the years 2019, 2020, and 2021. As the chairman of GSTN, he stabilized the newly introduced GST in India within a short span of three years. And prior to this, he was the chief executive officer and director general at the Unique Identification Authority of India, Aadhaar, from September 2015 until October 2019. A warm welcome uh, to uh, Dr. Rapani, who is, of course, joining us virtually from New Delhi. Next, we'd like to invite on stage uh, Mr. Rajesh P. Patil, IAS Joint Managing Director, City and Industrial Development Corporation of Maharashtra Limited, CITCO. Mr. Patil has over 14 years of experience in Indian administrative services. He has also served as the CEO of Odisha Skill Development Authority and uh, Director Employment. He has received several accolades and many awards over the years for his services and initiatives, including the President of India's Award for Working to Rehabilitate People with Disability. A warm welcome to Mr. Patil. Sir, kindly join us on the stage. Please give a round of applause also to our next speaker, Mr. Ranjan Kumar Mohapatra, Director, HR, Indian Oil Corporation Limited. Mr. Mohapatra joined Indian Oil in 1987 and has since worked on varied assignments, uh, including terminal operations, supply chain management and logistics, Indian Oil Oil's overseas establishment, among others. He is also chairman of Lanka IOC, Indian Oil subsidiary in Sri Lanka, which is into retailing, terminaling and bunkering operations in the island nation. A very warm welcome to you as well, sir. And our final speaker for this session is Mr. Neeraj Gupta, Partner Affairs Leader, PwC in India. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Gupta. Please join us on stage. Mr. Gupta has 26 years of experience in which uh, he has serviced clients across diversified industries such as retail and consumer, FMCG, automotive, telecom, pharmaceuticals, and ITES. He has deep domain knowledge across the spectrum of governance, risk, and compliance services, and has been actively involved in designing and implementing control, strengthening, and process improvement solutions for a variety of Indian as well as multinational companies. 
So those are our speakers and our honorable chair for this second uh, plenary session. I hand it over now to uh, Mr. Munji. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, do note that there will be time for a few uh, question and questions from the audience. So keep thinking, have your questions ready, and I'm sure Mr. Munji will uh, take some audience questions towards the end. Thank you all very much. Well, good morning. And uh, first of all, let me, I'm very grateful to IOD for kindly inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here in person with all of you. I think this is what, this is the first time in three years that, uh, that we've all got together. Uh, and I may long it continue. Um, so distinguished uh, panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna take a slight departure from what, what we heard this morning. Uh, I want to be very brief so that we have enough time. These are random thoughts. I'm not going to give you a speech. Um, but it's interesting because my own career has been straddled between the NGO sector and the corporate world. So for 20 years, more than 20 years, 30 years, I have been part, very much part of the NGO world. Um, chairman of several foundations and uh, rural support programs, et cetera, Indian Institute for Human Settlements, Miracle Feet, the whole range of them. And then, of course, been on a lot of corporate boards. So I see this from both sides. So I want to draw on some of the thinking uh, that, that I think is required as we move into the future. Uh, when the CSR initiative by government was announced, I was very skeptical. I said governments ought not to be prescribing uh, uh, social contribution. This should be coming from the, you know, from the corporate sector on its own. But looking back, I was wrong. I think, I think the CSR initiative by government has been hugely uh, beneficial simply because it's made corporates aware of the problems on the ground they're very much engaged in the issues uh, that the development agenda that India faces. And they're very much part of the contribution to helping on that agenda. We saw the numbers this morning, um, which were considerable. So there's a huge momentum moving. And I think this is a partnership now emerging between the government as well as the corporate sector, which is exactly what we should be doing as we move forward. Um, I want to also make a few comments on this inclusive responsibility. Today's uh, uh, theme of this seminar is inclusivity. And I think inclusive responsibility is an important concept that we need to be uh, keeping at the back of our minds. It, what it reflects is holistic, a holistic approach, not a narrow-minded sectoral approach, a flexible model, not a rigid model. And this, uh, these are some of the sort of, these are emerging trends of how we ought to be working. CSR India is only in its infancy. These are the first steps. We haven't matured it. It has a long way to go. And I want to suggest what those steps might be. But ethics and values are very cr critical to any company, extremely important. Because the tone at the top sets the whole uh, culture of the organization right down. Uh, we see racism, patriarchy, inequality, exploitation. These are all part of the corporate world uh, everywhere. But how do we look at the ethics and values and how do we put it down and sort of issue these areas? Move towards interdependence, pluralism, justice, equity, caring extremely important is caring. I've given lots of speeches about what is going on and I end each paragraph with who cares. If you do not care, all the intellectual uh, capacity, all the money in the world is not going to help unless you care. So caring is an extremely important notion behind, uh, behind this. So that is the starting point. Caring. Uh, 
100 years ago, Jamsetji, Nasirwanji, Tata founder and Tata group uh, creator, he said, in a free enterprise, the community is not just another stakeholder in the business, but is in fact the very purpose of its existence. I'll just read that out again. In a free enterprise, the community is not just a stakeholder in the business, but is in fact the very purpose of its existence. This is coming from a man writing 100 years ago. And then he developed it so that half the profits of the Tata industrial enterprise went to the situational logic. This is another word I use a lot. The situational logic in which that company found itself. Now, if you're in, the, in Britain, the situational logic is very different. US is very different. India is very different. So companies in India have to really define their situation logic. What are we living under? And what is our responsibility if we live and work in this country? So I think that that is extremely important. My professor at the University of Chicago was Milton Friedman. And his concept was the business of business is business. Why should it be getting into all these social stuff? It's a very right-wing philosophy. The business of business is business. You have to maximize profits, return it to shareholders. That's what you're about. You don't have to think about government's job is to do everything else. It's not your job. Right? Now, these are very two very different philosophies. Extremely different. There are still companies who believe business, business, business. Forget all this stuff. There are lots who are very much in the Tata fold that are merging into the Tata fold, that sort of philosophy. There are some in between. So I think we have to ask ourselves, as a board, when you strategize your, your sustainability CSR agenda, whose side are you on? Where are you in this spectrum? And then once you define that position, everything that you do will obviously come out of that positioning. Now, creating wealth is the purpose of companies. Governments don't create wealth. They, they, they garner their resources through coercion. You don't pay your taxes, you go to jail, right? So it's coercion. Governments coerce to raise money. Companies create wealth. And the question then is, how much of that wealth is shared? Under the Friedman thing, zero. Under the Tata thing, 50%. Right? Now, we have to, as a corporate world, given the logic we are in, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we do? This 2% is neither here nor there, in my view. It is what you are concerned about what you care about and how you work for it. So building a culture in an organization is so critical. It's not icing on the cake. It is the cake. The culture you build in a company is what that company is. It's like your character. Your character defines you. A culture defines a company. So I think it's so important that we, we, we concentrate on uh, on the culture, and the culture is puts down um, uh, puts down um, the sort of uh, 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 let's say the the uh, character of a company and its people. Company is nothing but its people. There's no such thing as corporate without people is empty. So how do those people think? How do they work? How do you create interdependence? How do you create collaboration within the company? Once you have that positive feedback, then you have the same thing translated to the outside world. Now, when I mentioned situational logic, let us, you know, we talk about India being a $3 trillion economy. We are going to a $5 trillion economy. All very well. And some of, some of India is absolutely doing brilliantly. You look at the startup world. You look at green cores of the world. You look at... Uh, uh, the Adanis of the world, you know, things are happening at a, at a huge scale. So there's a lot of, lot of robustness. 
But when you go to the social sector, you get very sad. I get very sad because I'm working on it. We work in rural development and I'm working on it for 30 years. The malnourishment of women and children in India is actually appalling. It's rising in the last five years. Now, can you imagine a country as wealthy as India allowing malnourishment of women and children to rise? It should be shameful. In the last five years, the rate has been rising. One third of the world's malnourished children live in India. One third. Among these, half of the children under three years of age are underweight. Now, what does that do to your feelings about, is this acceptable? And can you say 10 years from now, we'll have the same number? It's not acceptable. You know, it, I would say I care. It's my passion. So nourishment and malnourishment of women and children is my passion. It's got to be solved. Now, this is not a technical problem that can't be solved. It can be solved in two years. Why isn't it happening? My, quest, my uh, question always is, who cares? Unless somebody cares, it's not going to go away. Education, health quality are substandard at this level. Inequality is increasing exponentially. The richest 1% of the population own 58% of the wealth. And the richest 10% own 80% of the wealth. So 10% of India owns 80% of its wealth. Is that acceptable? Is that the society in which you want to live? Is that what defines this country? We have to ask ourselves, and we can't blame government or anything else. It's all of us who have to say, I care. Something has to happen. What that is, is let me conclude with that. Just one or two ideas. I mean, we can talk forever on this. Way forward is inclusive growth. Today, we have jobless growth. India is now growing, and the new growth is jobless. It's not creating jobs. If you do not create employment, you will have massive problems. So inclusive growth is about employing people, uh, bringing, uh, bringing everybody into the, into the organized, developed sector. Um, the development paradigm over the last 70 years has failed. And the question is, are we going to do the same thing? You think you get changed by doing the same things. Einstein's definition of madness was to expect change by doing the same thing. It's not going to happen. So we have to do something different. So how do we create these partnerships between corporate, civil society, and governments? This is the inclusive nature of the paradigm. I'm part of civil society as I am part of corporate, right? Show me which corporates are doing CSR without civil society institutions. Very few. You people don't go out and plant trees. There'll be some, some NGO who does that work which you will support to plant trees or to do sanitation or to do whatever. You are working through people on the ground. Those civil society institutions are very critical for, for India. And it's very critical that they be expanded. So in a sense, CSR today, if you, if, you, if you want to put money to strengthen the uh, uh, NGO, it's not counted as CSR. Why not? Surely the people who are actually working on the ground should be strengthened to do what they're doing well, to do even better. I mean, that's logical. Why? Why do we stop it? So I think there are lots of questions here. Even collaboration between companies now who have certain themes. Some people say we're in water or we're in tree planting or we're in carbon sequestration. They have themes. Why can't companies now get together with a common theme and upscale that together? Not try and do it individually. There's a lot, these are the next steps in CSR. We can actually leverage this in a huge way and be more efficient in getting impact on the ground. And lastly, I want to just leave you with the thought. I have, we've said that we can't wait 10 years. 
to see social indicators improve in India. We have to demand that it happens today. And it's not, it's no going point pointing at government because it's part of our com collective responsibility. We need speed, we need scale. If you don't have scale, you do not have speed, you're not gonna do it. But if you, if you want speed and scale, you have to have another S with a simplicity. Simple, simple problems don't need complex solutions. Simple problems need simple solutions. Because the simpler the solution, the more scalable it is, and the more, uh, 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 the more speed with which it can be instituted. And these are the three S's that are critical. There's one more S, which is sustainable. So sustainability. This, if you have these three and you have sustainability, you have a paradigm for completely transforming the future. Speed, scale, simplicity, and sustainability. And the issue is, who's thinking about this? We must revisit these rules. We must look at inclusive. When you say inclusive development, it's all of us together, get together and say, malnourishment is not is not women and children, which I see every day, is not acceptable for a country that's $3 trillion GDP. Just not acceptable. It's not the money that's a problem. It's the caring. We have to care. Somebody has to say, this is not acceptable. We have to do something. So it's caring. So let me leave you with my favorite quotation from Seneca, who wrote in the first century BC. If you do not know to which port you are sailing, no wind is favorable. This is true for your personal lives as to the economy as, to, as well as your company. If you do not know where you're heading, then nothing is favorable for you. So it's very important for you to set your sails according to where you want to go. And that, that is very, very need, uh, very critical. And we need, Scale, speed, combine simplicity and sustainability to get there. Uh, but we need to define this. Thanks very much. I just want to keep uh, throw some ideas out at you and perhaps the panel and then we can take it from there. Thank you. So uh, can I invite Ranjan uh, to, uh, because I'm sorry, I'm breaking the thing because you, you need to I think it just became good afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I must really appreciate the way you have brought in the whole thing to the topic. I think class to you. I think we must really appreciate that. That's that's too good. And of course, uh, we all know Tadas have been doing a great job, and you are one manifestation of that. So that's that's something. Uh, thanks to IOD, I think Kapurji, uh, all others uh, who are present here uh, for giving me this opportunity. Please pardon my voice. These days, somebody says, Ki, like, uh, I, I normally you start with a good morning, good afternoon. I'm starting every program with pardon my uh, throat, which is bad because of daily weather, nothing to do with me. So dignitaries on the stage, uh, fellow members from HR and CSR fraternity who have joined large numbers, I can see them, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start with uh, the elephant in the room. So that's something I thought, uh, that is what. Uh, see, normally corporate lift service notwithstanding, for all practical, practical purposes, what is CSR seen as? CSR is normally seen as corporate benevolence. And this has been more, I think probably this has been become more pronounced by this 2% target. Everybody wants to meet the target of 2%. So they would like to do it. I have loved the last few things which Nasirji has told about this collaboration. In fact, it's also part of SDG. I'll come to that at the end. So this is the elephant in the room which needs to be addressed by each one of us. If at the end of these two days, we are very clear that we are going to view CSR as a necessity. 
I think the purpose of this conference or this deliberations is done. I think, again, one more thing, everybody is talking of that. Now business organizations are social enterprises. Uh, we are a bit lucky that uh, being a public sector, we have been focusing on society since long, since our inception, but that's not true. That's not the only thing. I think probably whole world is currently moving from being a business enterprise to a social enterprise. You have to give back. It's, you are not just, I think your professor's uh, words, um, um, uh, trying to remember that only business, business or business is business. I think probably we all have to need to move out of that. A few things, I mean, like uh, as, as uh, he has also told, I would like, like to leave a few thoughts with all of you so that at least at the end of it, we understand what exactly is the purpose. And it's not a panacea for everything also. That also I'll try to come at the end of my, my, my deliberation. I'll try to come to that. It's not panacea for everything. It cannot solve all the problems which is expected, okay, okay, once you have CSR, everything is done, no. Then how do we do it? That also needs to be done. That's why I, I really must appreciate IOD for having thought of that inclusivity is extremely important. You must include people, you must include planet, you must include society, you must include your employees. Everybody must be included if you want CSR to succeed. Um, one more thing, I think I think uh, one more development which is also happening is that the reporting part of it. That's also becoming a critical part, which must be remembered at all points of time. I, I see, I mean, normally for CSR, I see these days uh, that uh, there are four essential pillars that can vitalize the CSR compliance. One could be accountability. The other one is openness. We must know what we are exactly doing. We must tell the world what exactly we're doing. So that is reporting. And the fourth pillar, pillar which is extremely important again, is transparency. And I, I think you, you all must have seen cases where people have funded it in a way that the CSR goes back to your people. No, that's not permitted. Even, even CSR uh, Act does not permit that. People have found out good ways of doing it. So this is where it is important. These four pillars need to be established at each point of time. Uh, we must also know how CSR forms the core tenet. We must go beyond. It, it must form a part of our entire day-to-day -day activities. It must, form, it must form a part of boardroom discussions. It's just not one project or one proposal getting signed, it has to form a part of the board strategy. So how does, how does it form a board tenet? I think, I mean, I, am, I can only share I am, uh, my, my 37 years in Indian oil, so I limited to Indian oil's experience. So I can only share from uh, my Indian oil experience that our journey has not been a journey of only mere excellence. Just now when I was meeting Mr. Bajaj, he told, uh, Oh, Indian oil, 725,000 crores, 7,25,000 crores. No, we are not by that. We should not like to be known by that. And that's, that's true for any organization. How are, what are your core values? We have, a, we have our core values of care, innovation, passion, and trust, but how they are being displayed for all my stakeholders and my stakeholders does not include the shareholders only. And this is where CSR plays a very core tenet. So I think, I think we have to, I mean, all of us, uh, what uh, we have to do, we have to work on that. And again, 2% thing has started now. I think many organizations, we also heard in the morning, many organizations um, and uh, the organization in uh, focus is Tata's they have been doing it and they have not been doing it on that 2% or 3%. That's just a number. That is just a number. For the last, uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we have not been making uh, uh, profits as we would like to have in a few last few years. So our CSR budget has shrunk. 
but that has not limited us to go limited to that we have gone beyond because okay or I mean the law provides that you can adjust it in three years but I know that it can never be adjusted you just but again how do we really make these contributions well that it stays and one big s which he also spoke of I would like to focus once again for all of you everything has to be sustainable and it has to reach the people whom it is meant for this is one these are the two things I, I probably feel are very important for CSR to succeed and to be inclusive. A few things which uh, definitely we um, have done in uh, in, in uh, different areas. Of course, uh, being a public sector, our focus has been on health. So we have a, a, a hospital. We have two hospitals. What I'm telling, again, the hospital, if you have a hospital in the urban area, that's different. If you have a hospital in, in, in an area which is not accessible or where people do not have access to core, I mean, I'm again uh, thinking, of the, uh, thinking of the example that was given in the morning by our CEO of uh, BAC, Bombay Stock Exchange, Sundaraman. He spoke about those, how what exactly is the is i mean what exactly is contribution or what exactly is meeting the res responsibility what exactly is the benefit so again so we we have uh, we have also associated recently with uh, i don't know how many of you are known honorable pm has taken a call that uh, um, um, although the target was 2030 that we would be making India TB moved by 2025. So Indian oil also has taken it upon itself that, okay, we can't do all. Can we do two states? So we have taken up in uh, Uttar Pradesh as well as Chhattisgarh, where we are associating with Central Board of TB, uh, CBT, and we are associating for diagnosis and cure of TB. I'm just giving this example. This is just one of the examples that we have where again, how do you include your society? How do you include the big ESG part of it into your daily activity of CSR? Uh, the, the one which I thought uh, I would uh, again like to re-emphasize what uh, Nasir has told that, uh, yes, number one, CS, I mean, what we are doing, that's not panacea for everything. We can't. We were discussing, and whenever we meet honorable, PA, honorable uh, MPs, uh, MPs, we keep on saying the same thing, that uh, the budget of government of India is, you know, wow, how many crores. And the CSR part of this, uh, this uh, uh, companies also form not even 1.1% of that budget. It cannot solve all the problems. So, but how do we do it? How do we make it? Yes, we can make a difference. Number one, we can make models of excellence. Example, when Honorable PM called for uh, uh, setting up this uh, uh, Sochales, so the, I mean the, uh, so when, when we had this call, few people, I mean, I, we used to see that in many places we have these toilets, which does not have basic water because it was told that toilets should be built. We all started building toilets and toilets after toilets were built, but there was no water. It's not a model. A model has to be inclusive of everything. So we decided, I mean, as far as the NL is concerned, we decided that even if we build one toilet, it has to be completed with water and uh, with water source, water storage and water movement. Everything should be a part of it. And this is just a model. We can't build toilets for everybody. But this is a model which can be adapted by all others so that people can see that this completes the, the purpose for which this call was given. And the second part, again, I'm uh, trying to take it, take it out from him. Collaboration. That's, a, that's an SDG. Well, there's also one SDG part, partnership and collaboration. Can we all partner to make a bigger thing 
where uh, instead of doing smaller things, we have been, I mean, again, uh, as far as we are concerned, I think um, uh, you may, I must share with you, with uh, Tata's uh, in uh, Assam, Barpeta, uh, uh, this uh, cancer hospitals, which is coming up, it's a major project, government of uh, uh, Assam is there, and uh, then uh, public sector, we are there, and of course, Tata's are driving it completely. So we are associated. And that is where, we, I don't know how many of you are aware here, Northeast has the maximum number of cancer. The percentage of people affected with cancer is the maximum in Northeast. And this is where the government of Assam decided. Tata's have uh, part, uh, I mean, partnered with them and we also have partnered. And now the hos hospitals which are coming up exclusively in Northeast will take care of this requirement. So this is what uh, the last thing which uh, I wanted to say. And then, of course, uh, uh, when we talk of ESG, we can't, uh, we can't exclude, uh, 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 when we are talking of inclusivity, inclusivity, we can't exclude ESG. So definitely we'll have to see at every point of time. So I would just like to leave you with one inspiring words of Dalai Lama. It is not enough to be compassionate. We all talk about it. It's not in, enough to be compassionate. You must act. I think so. I think it's time that we all act together. And I think probably most powerful social outreach tool that humanity has ever known is empathy. The big E, which it needs to be there. And only a socially empath empathetic organization, corporate, can definitely catalyze India towards uh, greatness. Thank you very much and looking forward to it. Thank you. Apologies to um, Dr. Uh, Ajay Bhushan Prasad. Um, we had to just reorganize the program. So uh, could I now call on um, Dr. Ajay Bhushan Prasad Pandey? Um, uh, of the National Financial Reporting Authority and former Secretary, uh, Finance Secretary, Government of India, to make his address. Once again, apologies for the delay. So, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm, am I audible? Uh, I just wanted to check. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'm indeed very thankful to IOD. Uh, for organizing this conference and also inviting me uh, for this uh, session. In fact, I had uh, uh, made plans to come there, but because of certain exigencies, I am not able to come. And that is why I have to address uh, 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 in this virtual mode. Uh, let me mention that, uh, you know, maybe some of you may be wondering that this conference is about the corporate social responsibility, CSR. And then uh, currently, you know, my current role is of, uh, in the NFRA is of the financial reporting, which is basically deals with the, uh, you know, the in a very narrow sense, somebody would say that accounting and auditors and standards and so on and so, what does it have to do with uh, particularly the corporate social responsibility? Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Munji also mentioned in his uh, 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 initial uh, talk that uh, he mentioned uh, that this CSR shouldn't be uh, uh, limited only to maybe a spending few percentage of money uh, for the social work. It is actually, uh, uh, it should be viewed in a different perspective. And it's the so corporate social responsibilities. And uh, if you see, uh, you know, even the current trend, the people are talking about the ESG, that is the environment, social, and uh, uh, governance. And unless and until you have that, uh, yeah, unless and until you have that, uh, you know, the good in. Uh, uh, a very strong environment, social, and responsibility uh, as the governance. Uh, actually, you are not meeting the responsibility towards uh, 
you know, all, not only the shareholders, actually the stakeholders. And then the stakeholders are, I would repeat, not only the shareholders, but also, you know, the larger society. And that's exactly, you know, when we are talking about the corporate social responsibility or ESG, I mean, E is the environment, S is the social, and G is the governance. And that is why it becomes very, very important to view this corporate social responsibility uh, in a much, much, you know, the wider context rather than just, uh, uh, you know, spending a few percentage of the money. Now, having said that, uh, you know, I will give you a little bit of perspective that, uh, you know, it is a matter of uh, pride for, you know, all Indians that, uh, you know, our nation has been interested with the, uh, you know, uh, role of uh, G20 presidency during this uh, 2023. And this has uh, come at a very, very important time where our democracy is celebrating 75th year of independence. And uh, of course, you know, our own role and responsibility in the global uh, global arena has occupied center stage. And, uh, you know, we are uh, uh, in the top five of uh, the GDP. We are the skill capital of the world and also information technology. In fact, you know, uh, I would definitely have mentioned some of the very, very major reforms and particularly the building blocks which have already happened here and which actually not only it is propelling the growth of our country, but also it's ensuring certain, uh, you know, the transparency, accountability, and including the governance. And, and you know, one of the major digital reforms, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, our country went through, and it's a unique in the entire world, was started with Aadhaar, and uh, finally uh, it led to a lot of transparency in the governance and direct benefit transfer, you know, the digital, and then today, if you see, uh, you know, the empowerment of people through the UPI and uh, payment, and then the Janathan, and then the mobile, and uh, even uh, the communications. So all these things, if you see during the last uh, few years, have actually taken India to a very, very uh, uh, different level. And it all has started, uh, uh, you know, it has put the basic building blocks and on which you know, the further more and more blocks are being built. So it's like, a, you know, the India is in the, I would say that it is like a bootstrapping mode where, you know, you go on, you use certain building blocks to make some few more building blocks and again use them to make few, you know, more and more building blocks. So these are the things and many of these things are unique to India and, and, it, is, and it is unparalleled in anywhere in the world. Now, having said that, now, you know, if this is going to happen, then particularly the uh, you know the kind of reforms that has been brought inside the government, so far as the transparency and uh, uh, and uh, the governance is concerned, there is also an attempt to make the uh, corporate sector because you know the economy is run not only by the government but also you know there are two wheels to this: the government sector, public sector, and then the private corporate sector, and therefore. There is a similar amount of social responsibility and transparency have to come uh, for the uh, you know in the uh, corporate sector also. In fact, I would I'm reminded of a uh, you know the uh, 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 research agency which had on the basis of uh, uh, the study of 37 OECD countries, including India and China. You know it was done in 2018, and they said that the corporate sector accounted for almost 85% of the gross value added of these economies. And if you consider India and China, I mean, it's still, you know, that ratio uh, uh, maybe wouldn't be of that level, but then ultimately, as we go, uh, uh, you know, as, as we go further, uh, this uh, number, you know, will be reaching to this number, you know, what we have seen in the OECD. Now, uh, the, uh, also, uh, you know, the sound corporate governance is the uh, bedrock of the corporate sector. Uh, again, I will quote uh, from a survey of uh, McKinsey that was done in way back in 2000, where the, uh, you know, the investors attached a very, very high uh, importance to the company's governance. And they were ready to pay a premium of almost 18 to 28% for the shares of the well-governed company, right? So, you know, having said that, 
you know, this having a good governance structure and uh, having a good, uh, you know, social, uh, you know, the responsibility uh, perspective within the company uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, of course, uh, you know, somebody can say that it is uh, philanthropy, but also, you know, it actually serves the shareholders and it strengthens the company. And that is exactly uh, what is uh, required. Now, you know, and if you're talking about this uh, uh, corporate governance and then the corporate social responsibility, as I said, it should not be seen in the narrow sense of, you know, uh, you know spending few money, uh, some amount of money for the uh, social sector or the social service. Improve the internal corporate governance of the company. And that is where, uh, you know, the uh, adherence to the standards, accounting standards, auditing standards, you know, and, you know, these things become very, very important. Off and on, you know, we hear uh, not only uh, within our own country, but also across the globe, you know, certain kinds of frauds happening in the companies, right? And when those frauds happen, then naturally, you know, the confidence of people in the corporate sector, uh, that uh, gets uh, uh, shaken. And that it is a... Uh, a lot of responsibility on the uh, uh, on the board of directors and then the directors and then the various regulators like uh, you know uh, uh, the, uh, the the corporate scams and then the corporate frauds you know almost every five seven eight years somewhere in the some part of the world and sometimes in a, in, a, in our own countries we keep seeing that for example you know this uh, uh, in 2002, when this Enron uh, collapsed, and this was a corporate failure, and then that resulted into the uh, strengthening of the regulatory structures. Surveillance Oxley Act was brought in in the US, and the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board was constituted, and that was basically to ensure the corporate governance and then the adherence to the accounting and auditing standards within the corporate uh, uh, framework. So that was introduced. That was followed up by, you know, establishing similar institutions in UK, for example, Financial Reporting Council, and then the Singapore, and then India also. India also had a, uh, you know, uh, also its own share of uh, corporate failures, like Satyam, then the PNB, and then uh, uh, ILFS. You know, the various kinds of failures have happened, and then uh, and accordingly, uh, the institution of NFRA, National Financial Reporting Authority, was constituted. Where we where we work with other regulators like uh, SEBI and uh, RBI and uh, uh, Comptroller and Auditor General to ensure that particularly uh, if the companies adhere to the sound principles of the accounting standards and if the statutory auditors adhere to the sound principles of the accounting standards, then it will be there will be very little scope for fraud or any deviation, and then it will lead to a better uh, corporate governance and better accountability and uh, and uh, and then the you know, the better uh, results in terms of corporate social responsibility. So that is what is uh, very very important. So the question is that you know having said that this is a uh, important area. Now the question is that how do the uh, what is the role of directors of the company and that is why this uh, particular conference being organized by Institute of Director is very, very critical because, I mean, this is a forum where, you know, where all the directors of the various companies, whether they're independent directors or, uh, you know, the uh, full-time directors or the executive directors, you know, all are part of this. And that is why it is very, uh, very, very uh, uh, important to uh, remember the, uh, you know, the responsibility which has been passed uh, under the various uh, framework or the laws or the, and basically what are the laws? Those laws are the society's uh, people's expectations, which have been codified through the parliamentary uh, uh, the, uh, laws and then the regulations of the various regulators. Now, the, uh, for example, I will mention some of the things uh, that many times, uh, you know, when I inter the various directors, right, and particularly the independent directors, so they sometimes ask that, look, you know, I mean, we attend the board meetings. And for a certain time, and then uh, you know, how do we uh, 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 you know uh, ensure that uh, you know the accounting standards and uh, have been adhered, or the auditor who is actually auditing this, 
they have done their job properly and no frauds have happened or the uh, or the internal financial controls have been followed so these are the questions that you know many of the directors at the level of board are saying and that is where you know, the it is very very necessary to look into the provisions of the law and particularly you know i will quote certain um, provisions i uh, 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 refer to certain provisions like section 134 of the company act there you know the responsibility has been cast on the board of directors to to give a kind of a certificate saying that you know there is no fraud in their accounting and then there are proper financial controls and that is the kind of, that is the signature that they have to do and similarly for the independent directors there is a particularly schedule 4 of the company act where there are certain responsibilities have been cast but they have to actually look into the accounts and then they have to satisfy themselves that all the accounts and the financial controls and other things are existing in the company and then there is a uh, no such uh, element of any misreporting or uh, or uh, or uh, you know any uh, wrong practice or leading to uh, which can tomorrow you know uh, give rise to fraud or some kind of a, uh, wrong doings so these are the some of the responsibilities have been passed now again the question arises that with this limited amount of time uh, you know how do they how do the directors and then uh, the uh, particularly the independent directors actually execute those responsibility because it is very easy uh, for uh, uh, to say in the law that you know they are responsible they have to give certificate but the question is ki how do they exactly do this so there uh, you know in fact i would suggest in fact i mean that would be my uh, you know the uh, uh, suggestion or advice to them is that today there is already a very sound system of uh, having in the statute law and because you know we are the regulators of the statutory auditors what we have found that many times uh, the role of the statutory auditor is limited to you know just uh, doing some mathematical calculation and you know not exactly uh, going into the you know the larger issue of the internal financial controls or the propriety and then because the auditing standards and accounting standards they are what, what india has done particularly for the listed companies and the large companies you know we have adopted the global standards and those global standards are such that if the uh, 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 you know if uh, they are actually followed in the letters and spirit then the possibility of uh, uh, you know the uh, scams and uh, this will uh, definitely reduce in fact there was a study where uh, uh, done in us where they said that after the introduction of uh, surveillance box we act the uh, you know the uh, incidence of scam and then the misreportings and other things they have uh, 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 you know reduced by you know maybe uh, around 15% or so so this is what it is there so what is required is by the board of director and then the independent director is that this would empower the uh, auditors today uh you know if i uh, you know many of the statutory auditors when they talk to me informally they say that look you know if we ask some questions saying that you know ask the board of director or the management or the audit committee you know sometimes you know uh, there is a feeling uh, inside the company saying that you know this auditor is asking too many questions maybe appointed a wrong statutory auditor we should have gone for some other auditor who could have just you know given us the certificate saying that you know our accounts are fine Uh, fine. I mean, that's not the uh, you know the right way of doing this, because you know the uh, statutory auditors works on the behalf of the board of directors and the audit committee and then the shareholders, and therefore the the statutory auditors who are supposed to go into the details of the your account and uh, inside and check the financial control, check the you know the areas where, where there are risk. check the areas where there could be a potential misreporting or potential fraud even at the lower level i'm not saying that every scam or every fraud is uh, done at the collusion of the people at the board level i uh, uh, not that but then let's say if it is happening at you know certain level inside the company then in that particular case you need to empower the board of directors and then the directors and the audit committee they need to empower the uh, statutory auditor and uh, they need to uh, uh, empower so that they can ask more and more questions and so that uh, the quality of the audit uh, is done and then you know you will have a better... sorry to interrupt you ajay 
we are yes. running short of time. So can you, in the next minute or two, sort of conclude? Yes, I'm concluding. Yes, yeah. thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So, so, so if that is done, and then uh, in that uh, case, uh, there will be a better corporate uh, governance and then the accountability. And uh, we can, uh, you know, there is a, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, quote the, uh, uh, you know, quote from the two professors from the Harvard Business School. Uh, school. And when they wrote an article, uh, Fall of Enron, and then they said that, uh, you know, the importance of the transparency within, this, uh, you know, the cor corporates. And, uh, you know, I mean, they wrote like, uh, you know, I would like to quote and, and end my uh, talk here, is that the investors want financial transparency. And that is the adequate information to assess reliably how a company is being run and what its prospects and risks are. But then the audit committee's current role is limited to narrow and technical ask, task of assuring that the firm is following generally, accepting, uh, generally accepted accounting principles as certified by the outside auditors. And then they said that they recommend that the board of directors and the audit committee be focused on ensuring that the investors have adequate information on the firm's economic reality. And therefore, you know, I mean, the uh, committee should work like a transparency committee. So I think with this, you know, I will end here. And that is, and again, at the end, I'm very, very thankful to the Institute of Directors for, you know, including this aspect of, uh, the uh, 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 corporate social responsibility and particularly the governance into this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pandey. I think a uh, uh, very comprehensive talk in terms of the governance and also the role of independent directors as well as financial reporting. So I think that was a very useful intervention. Thank you so much. Uh, for giving us Thank your you. time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now, um, um, can I call um, Dr. Sanjay Mukherjee? Uh, I think, Mr. Mohapatra, we just uh, request you to come back on stage. I'd like to uh, call on Mr. Kapoor to please hand over a memento to our distinguished guest since he has to leave early. And my apologies, sir, for interrupting you. Can we please have a memento? Thank you very much, Mr. Mohapatra, for taking out the time today. Thank you indeed. Thank you for doing the honors, Mr. Kapoor. Please proceed, sir. Thank you. My apologies again. Esteemed panelists and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, here to, as a replacement of my uh, vice chairman and MD, Dr. Sanjay Mukherjee. <laughs> I am Rajesh Patil. I am joint managing director, CITCO. Uh, I have joined uh, very recently, last week only. So till yesterday, I was taking brief from my uh, teams as to what all CIDCO is all about. And today I'm here to talk about uh, the CIDCO story, share about the CIDCO story. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, opportunity. Uh, we are deliberating here about uh, the uh, inclusive, uh, you know, CSR strategies and uh, uh, the role of the board members. So uh, I would like to uh, begin from where uh, Mr. Nasser has left. Uh, I believe that you know, creating a strong business uh, and building a better world, these are not conflicting goals. Similarly, I believe that you know, businesses cannot be successful when the society around them fails. So certainly the inclusiveness is very, very essential. And uh, I'm here to talk about CIDCO, which is uh, you know, 
not a 2% CSR company, but a 100% CSR company. And that is something which is uh, uh, core to the existence of uh, CIDCO. Uh, friends, when our country got independence, immediately after that, uh, all kind of development started in our country. And the growth centers, and uh, particularly uh, Mumbai started growing very fast. And uh, that time, uh, the visionary leadership, political leadership and bureaucratic leadership of the time, they thought it appropriate to have a satellite town just adjacent to Mumbai, which will not only relieve the pressure of Mumbai, but it will create a world-class physical infrastructure and which will be, uh, you know, specifically provide affordable housing options and a viable and sustainable city. So that is what is the mission and was the objective of the organization. And I am very happy to share that, you know, uh, over the period of time, CITCO is striving hard to achieve these objectives. I would begin with the uh, aspect of providing affordable houses, which otherwise from that time till now is very uh, distant dream for the uh, for maximum people who work in Mumbai. So, so far we have built uh, more than uh, 1,24,000 houses and maximum of these houses, like up to 52% of these houses, they are for the people who are at the bottom of the pyramid. So not only this, but more than four times of the houses, uh, I mean, the CIDCO has facilitated, whereby the private equity and the developers, they have built for the people in New Mumbai area. And, you know, the, what has happened uh, is that because of the plan development and kind of facilitation by the CIDCO, uh, there was a competitive environment which, which, uh, which was seen in CIDCO area, whereby even the prices of the houses uh, developed by the private developers, they had to compete with the CIDCO, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of the costing and it helped and that is true about the facilities and amenities which these people need to give to the tenements. So that is something I think uh, which is which is very positive. And I think the model is, is so unique. So hereby, when we talk about inclusiveness, I would like to emphasize that, you know, the houses uh, which were distributed and made available by the CIRCO uh, to the people, among them, uh, CIRCO has ensured that there is ample reservation for person with disabilities. There is reservation from people who have served in armed forces. And then people who, uh, whose income is, uh, is, is very low. So that has ensured that the affordability aspect is taken care of and people realize their dream not in Mumbai, but you know, in the neighborhood of Mumbai. So the next phase of housing, which which has seen, is after the launch of the Prime Minister Awas Yojana, a very ambitious program of our Honorable Prime Minister, and uh, the uh, urban part of this uh, Prime Minister Awas Yojana is is being uh, very aggressively pursued by Sidco, and it is probably the only agency and we are only the uh, probably the only state where in the urban areas this scheme is uh, taking big stride and we have plans to construct 68,000 houses uh, in 11 locations uh, which are mainly uh, you know uh, under the transit oriented development model whereby these houses are coming up near the metro stations or the uh, bus terminals so that the people who will stay in these houses mainly from the low income strata they can easily commute to any part of the MMR region and that is something I think uh, is uh, is adds so much of value to the lives of these people 
So uh, the other ambitious uh, housing projects, which uh, we will be taken up in near future, uh, they are like the redevelopment of the old houses in uh, uh, New Mumbai area. Almost 25,000 crores will be uh, the cost. So massive rebuilding activities are going to happen. Uh, similarly, in two cluster in Thane, uh, uh, we will be doing uh, the uh, renewal of the existing, uh, you know, a very crowded and uh, uh, undeveloped areas and uh, uh, creating al al uh, the environment which is there in the new Mumbai. In the phase two of PMAI, Sidco is looking forward to kind of uh, see that, uh, you know, more one lakh more houses are constructed. So this is all about housing. So in the housing also, I would like to emphasize that uh, the focus was not only to create the uh, concrete jungle, uh, the what, what uh, sets apart to this overall CITCO initiative about housing is to provide the ur urban model urban uh, living for the common man. And here, a lot of ample uh, spaces for the uh, uh, you know, senior citizen, children, many gardens and uh, greenery is developed, wide roads, educational facilities, banks, and so many other things which are essential ingredient of the modern living, they are being provided uh, in a neighborhood. So that is, uh, that, that thing is uh, very unique uh, than the any isolated project anywhere in the country. So the sustainability aspect, and at the same time, to see that the innovation is nurture, is, is, is something which is core to all the projects in uh, Sidco. So uh, I would like to give an example how uh, Sidco has contributed uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, giving relief or uh, kind of, uh, 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 I mean, recognizing the service of certain section of society, uh, we have distributed almost 4,488 houses uh, to the COVID warriors, uh, the nurses, uh, police personnel, paramedicals, uh, people who otherwise have contributed a lot, a lot during the COVID uh, pandemic time. And that was something which, uh, you know, which was like a healing touch uh, from the uh, uh, CIDCO on behalf of the government. So what, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the overall strategy of development of the CIDCO uh, is, is not just creating uh, concrete jungle or see that roads are built, uh, but to see that, you know, there is a liveness, uh, there is a sustainability aspect. And uh, the most important aspect is uh, that the connectivity and mobility is, uh, is, is the core of all the development. Starting from the time of uh, the uh, harbor line, uh, uh, local line development, till now uh, the metro development and uh, the many multimodal corridors are being planned in near future. So these, uh, these corridors will not only connect all uh, I mean, all areas of MMR region, but they will uh, enhance the mobility. Since now the uh, international airport is coming up in, uh, uh, you know, New Mumbai area, anyone uh, from the MMR region uh, can reach out to the uh, uh, airport in a limited uh, amount of time. So a lot of this planning is happening. I would like to just mention that, uh, you know, this, you may be seeing a lot of, uh, uh, Construction activities uh, from Sivri to Nava Seva uh, uh, link is being getting created, uh, which will uh, connect the core uh, uh, Mumbai area with the international airport. Similarly, uh, the link is getting created from the Ambarnath and uh, uh, that area. So likewise, uh, there is planning of uh, uh, so many projects in near future, which will change the face of this uh, area. So not only this, but uh, the, uh, the focus is to see that uh, the growth is uh, getting multiplied and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, new international corporate park and uh, the uh, uh, conducive environment uh, is, is, uh, is kind of strengthened 
and uh, the employment growth and the uh, contribution to the economy of the area is is multiplied by uh, all kind of uh, interventions so i would in the end would say that uh, sidco is is uh, basically uh, has not only uh, created a new town but it has uh, created a town which is uh, which is a unique example of a 21st uh, century indian urban uh, uh, you know urban town whereby it has very beautifully graduated from the uh, small township uh, cluster of township to a uh, sustainable city where the uh, aspect of smart city where the aspect of uh, you know greenery where the aspect of livability where the aspect of ease of uh, living is is ingrained into the uh, development process and i think uh, this is a very unique model whereby we can now uh, kind of replicate many aspect of uh, the experience in sitco area uh, to various uh, urban centers uh, throughout the country so uh, in the end i would like to just uh, highlight few examples how while executing the big project or while uh, creating massive infrastructure how sitco has taken care of very small uh, uh, you know social needs and uh, the community living sitco has over the period of time uh, given more than 100 acres of land uh, for the development of uh, the educational religious spiritual and social sector activities and this has uh, you know converted the uh, living in that area uh, from the uh, you know normal urban living to a preferred and aspirational living and not only this uh, in terms of environment also like the recycle and reuse of water conservation of uh, environment by strengthening the mangrove forest uh, allocating almost more than 3000 acres of land which otherwise belong to sidco uh, uh, i mean giving it back to forest department uh, for the conservation of mangrove forest during the pandemic uh, you know uh, sidco came forward with all its resources and capabilities to help the mmr region uh, with uh, you know creating the oxygen beds uh, to the tune of more than 3500 and the icu beds so i would say that uh, when we talk about csr inclusive csr uh, there are uh, you know the example like uh, sidco in the public sector they are very unique and there is a lot to uh, learn so i would like to give this uh, message to the august gathering here that uh, you know uh, there is lot which every organization can do and uh, uh, that's all from my side thanks for this opportunity thank you so much thank you so much rajesh sorry for getting it wrong <laughs> Um, but, you know, I knew R.K. Sinha very well, and we knew the early parts of Sitco's development over many, many years. So thank you for that uh, presentation on what has been happening there uh, in recent years. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. All on the last speaker, uh, but not the least, uh, uh, Dr. Neeraj Gupta uh, from PwC. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Okay. Let me first start by thanking the Institute of Directors for, you know, allowing us from PwC to come and talk to you. Uh, and I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so I will try and stick to the time. Uh, before we get into what we want to discuss with you based on our own PwC India Foundation's work and what we hear from, from our work at clients, 
I want to step back and and look at some of the data points that have been talked about. So uh, if we look at the MCA data, the total spend on CSR in 2021 was 25,700 crores. And over the last five, over the preceding five years, it has increased at a rate of about 79%. Let's overlay this data with the fact that we are trying to become a $5 trillion economy in two years from now, or maybe we get there in three years from now. Just imagine the amount of funds that will be available for CSR in this country. And if we channelize those well, we spend them in the right direction, we can make a huge impact to the socioeconomic development of the country and also contribute to the UN's uh, SDG goals. So that's the first macro point I want to make before I get into some of the points I want to discuss. The second point is that many of the speakers talked about the focus areas of the spend. So if we were to peel this onion of 25,700 crores, the top three areas of spend are education, rural development, and healthcare, right? But are those fully aligned with our needs today? What is happening with the environment and the climate in the US? What is happening in our own India in the town of Joshimat? If we look at the actual spend on environment and climate, it's under 5%, right? So that's the other point I want to make as we go forward. And the third point is that the government uh, through the Niti Aayog has identified 112 aspirational districts where it wants to you know, accelerate the development. Now, about half of these districts are sitting in the states of Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha, and Chhattisgarh. Again, if you look at the data, these four states receive roughly about 5% of the total spent. So, you know, while we are doing a lot and there is potential to do more, I think it's also important for us, you know, in conferences like this, initiatives like this, to step back and see uh, whether the focus needs to change and of course the inclusiveness of the whole thing. So with those three data points, I have a few slides which I'll use as a background and I'll, I'll talk through them. So coming to the first part. No, no, I think whoever can change the slide, that's okay. Okay, okay, I will do it. Is this the point, this is the point too? Yeah, but I don't know what's, okay. So if we look at the history, uh, you know, inclusiveness and CSR is not new to India. We looked at the first references to it in the, in the 2007, in, uh, in 2007 in the 11th uh, five-year plan. And then, you know, things have evolved. But there are two points which I want to uh, highlight here just now. One is that India was the first country in the world to actually legislate CSR into a law. Right, and we started with a comply or explain approach, and then and then we went on to a comply approach, and the and secondly, the law casts an onerous responsibility on the board. The board is the main vehicle, uh, you know, who has been tasked with overseeing this whole program and spend in in corporates. Now, you know, so so what is the role of the board here? What do we want the board to do? Now, typically under law the board would have a CSR subcommittee and the subcommittee would have to do three or four things. They have to ensure that they, you know, review, understand and approve the CSR program of the company. They have to monitor and oversee its execution. They have to make sure that the funds are being spent in the right way, the right amount of funds are being spent. And they have to also ensure compliance with the law of the land that is the 2% being spent, or if it's not being spent, then explain and deposit the amount as required. And then also make the necessary disclosures in the director's report, right? So, so that's the first part of uh, you know, this whole thing. And the director, and it is the directors who are tasked with this onerous responsibility. So when we are saying the board and CSR, it is the board who's going to deliver the CSR. At the end of the day, the buck stops there. 
Now, but why should the board do this? Uh, there are a number of advantages. And you know, many of my fellow speakers have talked about some of the common advantages such as better governance, risk management, and so on. I want to focus on two of these things. One is that you know there is a clear important thing that is coming out, which is the societal license to operate, which was referred to earlier. You know, businesses operate in society and you can't divorce yourself from society and expect to operate successfully. So that's one important point I want to make. The second is that there are, you know, a lot of commercial advantages. It's not just about because it's a responsibility and it's mandated by law, so I have to do it. You know, it was talked about that 18 to 28 percent premium is what, you know, financial institutions and banks are willing to, to, give, to give to invest in a, in a company that's more socially responsible. Even today, customers identify better with a brand that is socially responsible, whereas brands which are not socially responsible, customers tend to move away from them. And the other point I want to mention on this slide is about the employee engagement which was all refer, uh, earlier referred to briefly. But you know, employees today are very much clued on. They know what the company is doing, what, the, what is happening in the workplace, what are your CSR programs. And it just creates not only a feel good factor, it increases the motivation and morale levels, and it increases the stickiness of the employees. So, you know, during COVID times, companies saw huge attrition, turnover. Some of that can also get impacted positively as you know as companies are becoming more and more socially responsible now having said that there are a few uh, you know challenges here which we put down based on our experience and i'll i'll talk about some of them i mean they are quite quite simple but one of them is that you know there's not enough monitoring around what we are doing and even when we monitor the monitoring is more around did we adopt 100 villages we adopted 50 schools, we built 500 toilets, but where is the impact? Where is the qualitative assessment of the impact that you are trying to create, right? That is missing. And the other point that I want to talk about the, on this slide is that sometimes these programs are isolated. We've seen programs are scattered. Programs may be good by themselves, but are they coming together to form a, form a theme, is it a thematic uh, that's coming out of this whole, whole CSR piece? Or is it just that somebody came to me, achha ye kar do, chalo kar diya. Somebody else says, oh, main yaha pe ye kar raho, thoda sa help kar dena. We did it, right? That's also fine. But, you know, you have an opportunity to do, to do more. Okay. And the last point here is that I want to talk about is that sometimes we, you know, we implement these CSR programs through various partners. And I would say that I would urge based on our experience that the credibility of some of these sort of so-called implementation partners becomes a big stumbling block later on. You know, because for many of the CSR spends, uh, you do require an audit to be done. Uh, the, the CSR committee has to monitor the spend. And then we've seen that the feedback that comes is, is not really very, very positive. So these are some of the pitfalls that we've seen you know, around uh, CSR and then boards have to navigate this challenge. So now coming to, uh, coming to inclusiveness, see, corporate India is doing what it can, but it's a question of yeah, dil mange more. You know, everybody wants more, society wants more, customers want more, vendors want more. So what we believe is that there are a few questions you have to ask yourself. First of all, you have to step back and look at your program. I mean, is your, is your CSR program well thought through? Is it inclusive? Is it relevant? Or does it just you know, comprise of certain ad hoc initiatives being taken? The second question you may want to ask yourself is that, you know, is it aligned to national priorities? Is it aligned to what the government is trying to do in this country? Is it aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for example, right? So those are the, some of the things you have to answer. How, how frequently do you monitor? How do you monitor? How frequently do you monitor? And how do you sort of disclose or communicate the results of what you're doing? I think these are some important questions we believe boards should consider as they are going about looking to make their CSR programs sharper and more inclusive. 
And on the inclusivity part, there are certain key aspects which we think must be considered. So the first thing on inclusivity is that we need to make sure that eventually, you know, the business of business is business and that to an extent will remain. So there is a business strategy. Now, is your, is your CSR strategy aligned to your business strategy or are they pulling in different directions? Because if you really want to make it inclusive and impactful, you have to merge the two. Your CSR strategy and your business strategy at some place need to talk to each other. So that's one of the things that you have to consider. The second is that, you know, traditionally we've been talking about stakeholders, which is your shareholders, your investors and so on. But it's high time we really expanded the focus to talk about the entire stakeholder, uh, stakeholder group, whether it is communities in which the business operates, whether it is, it is your supply chain, your vendors, your customers, your employees, the families of those employees, because in a way they also support your business, right? So, so that's the second point. The third one is we have to consider non-traditional aspects. You know, uh, there is e equality in pay, diversity in the workplace, making the workplace safe, fair labor laws. What is the in environment, in environmental impact of my supply chain? So we have to expand, uh, you know, what we are doing to start looking at some of these things. And then there are other things uh, which we are talking about, uh, which is again, uh, you know, the whole inclusiveness piece will actually come together very well. When the board considers some of these aspects, you know, while they're asking those four or five questions that, that we talked about on the earlier slide. And this, this has to continue to expand. It's, it's not just about that I've done so much today and I've achieved, achieved 2% or I've achieved 3% or 4%. You know, people are sharp, society is sharp, they're all, they're all watching. And, and this is something that we have to do. Before I conclude, I would also like to tell you that we in, a, we in PwC have a PwC India Foundation through which we do a lot of CSR. We don't call it corporate social responsibility. We've moved a step beyond that. We call it our corporate social program. It is a CSP, just like you have a, in our, in our consulting organization, just like you would have a client satisfaction survey program, you would have a training program, security program, we have a corporate social program. So that's one part. And second is that we also work with a lot of clients, trying to help them on the whole CSR piece. And whatever I've spoken to you about today is a very, very high level summation of what we've seen from our work at so many clients. Before I conclude, uh, I just want to go back to what Mr. Manji said. You know, his professor Milton Fredman in 1970 wrote an article in the New York Times saying the business of business is business. 52 years later, so many people from corporate India, so many distinguished speakers are sitting here spending so much time. It clearly tells me that the needle has moved significantly from the time that statement was made. And let me close by trying to answer your other question, sir. Who cares? I think you care, we care, all of us care. Corporate India cares because again, we are standing here investing time, including the government. So I think that we are at the cusp of something big. It's up to us now from here on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neeraj, for giving us, you know, the the impact of his, I mean, you know, PwC looks at so many clients all the time. And I think we saw uh, a summary of uh, the, the uh, status of CSR and what are the sorts of processes and how we might look at it in the future. Um, but as you say, we care. But if we really care, what are we going to do about it? So it's the action that's more important. But I think there's enough talking from our side this whole morning, I want to hand it over to the audience uh, for any comments, uh, questions, etc. But make it short. Yeah, please. It's better to have a mic. Hello.
CEOs and personnel could be take leads in this whole process because they are so experienced. Can one build a whole sustainability um, uh, framework using a lot of expertise? I would also argue that most companies don't have sustainability expertise internally. I think, you know, we have audit compliance, we have all this. Where's your sustainability group? Or are we just going by the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, seat of your pants approach? You know, yeah, yeah, we're doing something and we're trying to learn. No, sustainability today is going to be an important element for the business plan. It has nothing to do with CSR. Let's say the incorporation of um, renewable energy can save you costs as well as be sustainable. You could build your cost structures down by being sustainable. Now, who's, who in a company is looking at these opportunities to rechange and recast the business plan of the company itself using what is going on in the sustainability world? That expertise is not internal. And if it's not internal, then you can't, uh, you can't actually uh, benefit from what's going on around you. So I think it's very important for companies to have, you know, one or two experts in a sustainability unit that is looking at everything with the eyes of sustainability, not just CSR, but the business model itself. So, yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as a founder and an executing director. Sorry, where are you? Ah. So as a founder and an executing director to a startup gaining traction, to truly care about society at large and take adequate action with speed, scale, and simplicity, I feel a good dialogue and action with experts and masters should be engaged at the board level regularly. What would be the panel's suggestion to get the same put into place effectively and efficiently? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm asking the same question. <laughs> How do we get everybody onto the same page when you want to get the scales? I started with the NGO world because, you know, NGOs learn, I call them action experiments. They learn on the ground, action learning over years. So today, solutions to all our problems on the ground is already in place. We don't have to reinvent anything, but we don't know how to get it to scale. Ideally, you'll, you'll say that these are things that work. Please, government, use your machinery to implement, right? But governments don't have that capacity. And they say to us as an NGO, are you doing such good work? Take five districts, take 10 districts, take all the districts, but do it. We said, we can't, we don't have the scale. We are not, we're an NGO, we are not a government. So, you know, you have this problem and you know what to do, but you can't scale it. I'll give you an example. We, we, we uh, in Bihar, we started using solar pumps, but under control of women's groups, right? The women controlled how much water was taken. So the optimum use of water, you don't just keep this pump and water flowing because of shortage of water. And then how, which farmers and how much they will pay for their waterings, but all on solar. So it didn't have anything to do with electricity. When Nitish Kumar saw how that whole thing worked, he said, I want this in every district. So scale. The government took the scale, we gave the ideas, and then we monitored the, the execution. The same thing with, uh, uh, we are very much into early childhood education. ECD is extremely important. What happens to a child in its first four years is, determines its future. And um, so we did, uh, we've been doing this for years and I didn't, I didn't see scale. Finally, the Tal Telangana government gave us the entire Anganwadi infrastructure in Telangana said, you do it. So for the first time, we looked at some scale and now we have a huge scale program working in Telangana. We want to see whether that model can be used in uh, other states. But you know, these are all, Tricky issues is how do you how do you get the uh, the scale mandate? Now nutrition is very critical. If I if you said who cares, 
I would say that in two years, if I was uh, in government, I would say in two years, this problem has to be solved. There should not be a single Indian child who is malnourished or a single Indian mother that's malnourished as a mission. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? Why aren't we doing it? 10 years, 30 years, 70 years have gone by when we do this. And when I was at the, uh, when I was at the ECD, one of our ECD programs uh, in Bihar, I asked, you know, this was like three-year-olds going through this ECD and their mothers were there. And I asked the mothers, I said, what do you think about the program? So they said, it's lovely. We really, we are so thrilled. But we know that we know nothing. So what can we teach our kids? Imagine the power of that statement. We know nothing. What can we teach our kids? And 90% of them are illiterate. They cannot read the label on a medicine bottle. How are they going to look after their children? This is the state of the country today. We talk 3 trillion, 5 trillion, but you're seeing 40% of our women are illiterate. Is that acceptable? No, it's not. And if we were a humane society and we were a concerned society and we were a caring society, we will not let this happen. Somebody has to start screaming and saying, this is not on, right? So it, these are the, this is the sort of thing where CSR, I hate the word CSR, because it's, 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 it's a commitment to do the right thing. And then to bring partners together and tell government, we are prepared to do this. You should do this. Let's all do this. We as a country should solve this problem. We are all in it. You are in it. We are in it. Individuals are in it. But we must solve this problem. Why can't we do it? Sir? Sir, Sir. Here, over here. Yeah. Over here. Uh, this subject to which uh, Mr. Mandi uh, has been uh, collaboration of themes. I have been talking a little bit on this with Neeraj also when uh, during my tenure of CEO in one of the Zohari group company. Uh, you see, CSR being board driven activity for the policies and uh, choose, uh, choosing the themes and all that, some themes get lots of focus. Some themes get no focus or less focus. So there is no, not a, uh, there's not one balance. I have one small suggestion that we should have a collaborative team between corporates, social bodies, and the administration at national level, regional level, as well as local level to address to the problems, the nationwide problems, region-wide problems, local problems. And they should decide the themes, and then it should go to the board and they approve it. This suggestion I have been giving for at uh, many forums, and I want to give this suggestion to uh, corporates and administration uh, through this forum. So a bottom-up right. approach. Yeah. Yeah, bottom-up, exactly. Right. What is concerning people? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So can I ask a question? Sorry, there's a lady here. Oh, sorry. Hello everyone, I'm Rekha Sharma, uh, Operations Director, Rip Global. I think what Mr. Verma just discussed, I have this opposite question, or rather I would say, I would like to hear from Sir, what is his opinion about the role of leadership in decolonizing their thinking about the whole process of sustainability? Because I completely agree, I think we are focusing on social, society, but everything is interconnected when it comes to environment, when it comes to safety, when it comes to culture of the organization. And somewhere I would say, it is the culture of the organization, how leaders, the top leaders and the owners of the business, they think about the sustainability of their business itself. Yeah, no, yeah? absolutely. Yeah, so how, maybe you can just- Well, just very briefly, um, the world is committing collective suicide today. We are all in this game together. 
we are killing our planet. And climate change is clearly the need of the hour. If there's one thing that we have to look at is climate change, nothing else, because sustainability is part of that climate change thing. Look what happened in COP. Governments are just not interested. Reluctantly giving a little here and there. You look at the young generation screaming, saying, what are you leaving us? So there's a huge upswell from the young. But our generation are saying, you know, we, we can't really. And 27, India is 2070. You know, we're not concerned if it, uh, it goes up by four degrees when the whole world is destroyed. So climate change is your number one priority. And I think if there's a common dialogue, uh, is that how each of one of us can, whether it's an individual in your home, company, what can the company do on sustainability? And what can the country do on sustainability? So it's a right, it's a whole range of things. But as you say, leadership, but leadership comes when everybody's incensed by a problem, right? So we've got to get people incensed. We just don't do that. Nobody, you know, all of it is yeah, peripheral. Now look at the city agenda. We have, nobody's mentioned cities. The biggest problem on is our, our major cities. They are totally unfit for future and they're falling apart. Just by building buildings in your city, that it's the infrastructure. India, uh, Bombay needs six sewerage treatment plants, half of one that works. Is that acceptable? So the, this is the problem. Who's responsible? And how many CEOs of Bombay City know what is happening in Bombay City? And I'm now creating through the Bombay Chamber a dialogue between what is going on in the city and key CEOs and putting power to power. Because the CEOs must address this with the municipality. You are my saying something is not going to happen. So I think these are all experiments that we are working on to bring these things alive. Anyway, I think we have to stop because I've been told we've run out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed. Uh, lots of insights from this session and I'm sure you'll all get a chance to you know, talk to our panelists outside. Uh, thank you all again. And I'd just like to invite Mr. Kapoor on stage uh, uh, to hand over some mementos that represent our gratitude for your time today. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, uh, Dr. Pandey is in Delhi, so his memento will be shipped to him. Can we have the mementos, please? A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. An insightful session. Thank you, Mr. Munji, for very effectively chairing the proceedings. Wonderful. <laughs> Mr. Patil, thank you very much once again for being here. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, please. And Mr. Gupta, thank you. Thank you indeed uh, to all our speakers for taking out the time today. Ladies and gentlemen, we are taking a lunch break now. Uh, and I do understand that the proceedings are slightly delayed, but request your cooperation uh, in please uh, returning to the hall at 2.10. So the lunch now concludes at 2.10. We'll begin proceedings uh, 10 minutes past 2 o'clock. Thank you once again. Enjoy the break.